hands around the neck, no more like a millstone, a plumbing stone, my God. Damn them all. I, I like a funny <laughs> funeral. I've, I've, been to, I've been to a handful. Um, It wasn't a funny funeral, but I was just, I just, I, I just made a big faux pas. Oh, listen to Frenchie. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. It says <laughs> Bo. <laughs> Your name is literally French. It, it, but not spelled like that even remotely. It's not spelled like that. Yeah. It's more spelled like uh, the dog that everyone has. Oh, I just when, like go B-O. So. Yeah, that's right. That's it. And And when I was growing up, I'm sure it was either it was either Bo Duke, uh, made famous from the Dukes of Hazard, of course, right, of course, yeah. or it, I either got that or I have a dog named Bo. Those were the the two associations people had with that name. Oh, really? That's very kind. Do you remember what I told you? I thought of when I heard that your name was Bo. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I said, like the actor from Walking Tall 2, Bo Svensson? Oh, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't get a lot of Bo Svensson. I get a little bit of, uh, what was the athlete that was in the NFL and played baseball? Oh, yeah, Bo knows Bo guy. Jackson. I don't know his last, Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so I got what a little bit What about little of that. Bo Peep? <laughs> That's uh, in the quiet times and the night times when he's alone. <laughs> That's what my girlfriend calls my penis. Oh! <laughs> It's far too embarrassing for me to reveal the nickname that mine has been given. Actually, there's yeah, not, mine too. Yeah, there's not an official nickname <laughs> at, at present. I really, really feel like it should be now. It should be called Little Bo Peep. I'll, <laughs> under no circumstances should anyone tell her that because I, I don't need to live with that. Yeah, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm if we drop the little part, maybe just Bo Peep. Bo Peep, nah, <laughs> that's still Lil bad. Peep. <laughs> How about we stop? Peeps. Anything that peeps is like cute and little. How about proportional bow peep? How about that? <laughs> How about size 11's bow peep? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the shoes are size 14, sister. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Although that does not, it turns out, translate. Um, not, <laughs> it's not a one to one, at least. But this is this is all gold. We should have been having this on the actual show. You must uh, I'll take some of this. I yeah we're we're, we're recording we're oh recording, yeah, let's, yeah let's yeah let's just jump into it I'm Bo and I'm Kate sorry I'm drinking water I'm Kate <laughs> and this is another uh, bonus episode of the Dark Parade of course this is Heart of Horror in which uh, Kate and myself talk about horror movies that are romantic or deal with relationships and that kind of thing and uh, before we introduce our, our very special guest I would like to say. For the record, uh, it was very nice to have uh, a lot of feedback from the show. People were very kind about listening to it. And, yeah. And also to reiterate, if you would like to share a story, then feel <laughs> free to do so, but you can do so privately. Um, 100%. Yeah. And just uh, message us on Facebook or you can email. Uh, yeah. You can hit me up at bow at legionpodcasts.com. Um, or, or, you know, or ask questions. Yeah, questions and also. You can ask questions that you want answering for yourself, or you can ask me and Bo questions about us, if you want. Whether we'll answer is, <laughs> is another thing, but... Yeah, it turns out neither of us, though, have much of a filter. It's true, it's real true. <laughs> so, uh, but one <laughs> one person who did reach out to us was our guest tonight, who was like, I need to be on your show. Oh. And it was it was very kind so cute and so we have brought the adorable court psyops <laughs> with us for this journey tonight and so Great. welcome court I don't, I don't know too many folks that have referred to me as adorable outside of maybe my own mother once or twice but thank you i really appreciate that but yeah uh, i i totally fangirled when i saw this well, when I heard the podcast i'm like oh my gosh i gotta be on this this is so great i love it i love everything about it Love stories mixed with horror and then stories about your own life that match in with the actual movie for the review stuff. I just, it's a great idea. I think you guys came up with something that's really special here. And I mean that. And that's why oh. I got so stoked. And that's why I was like, I got to be on the next episode, please. Like, I just, I begged Bo for like ever. He was like pushing me away like that annoying little dog. 
with his big pal Spike. <laughs> He's like, oh, come on, come on, Bo, come on, come on. He's like, it's up to Kate, shut up. <laughs> oh my God, I was literally like, oh no, I need to check with Bo. Like, I'm cool with this, but I just, I can't speak for both of us. Like, I'm sure it'd be fine, but I don't want to like, you know, like anything and um, and everything. And Bo was like, no, no, get him on. So, okay, good, I'm really glad you said that because I really want him to come on, you know? like, Because hey. um, <laughs> you and I have never recorded together. No, actually, oh, we have right? never actually, yeah, we've never actually chatted, chatted other than the like messenger, you like, know, like yeah, messenger like the text. voice notes. Yeah, well, you've given me some voice notes, but and I've <laughs> I've just I've just kind of typed back and everything, but yeah, this is the actual first time both of our voices have been mm-hmm. used for us to converse, Kate, and it's have like intermingled. It, it, yeah, it's it's absolutely lovely. We always have lovely chats, but this, yeah. I'm I'm already fully satisfied with how this is turned out. Well, <laughs> and we haven't even done shit yet. That's it. Now the episode's done. <laughs> yeah. Well, our guest tonight was Court Psyops. Um, <laughs> we'll tune in yeah. next time. <laughs> yeah. Good night. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Uh, no, no, we haven't even introduced the movie yet, and th- part of this episode is really me making other people watch one of my favorite movies of last year. <laughs> It's true. It's true because you told me about this film last February. Yeah, it, it um, made my my best of 2020, and yeah. and I was like, everyone needs to see this movie because mm. it will it will both break your heart and warm it all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, and I well, I mean, I got a little busy with the summer series and the launch of my own show and things, and so I just <clears throat> there is so much that I need to watch. Um, and it, this is one of them, and I'm just so glad to have a cheeky excuse to bump it to the top of my list. Um, because a few people I've heard a few, not just from yourself, Bo, but if, like a few people have sort of um said how good this is and things, and that I'd really like it and stuff. So, um, it's been really good to tick it off for sure. And Court, you had not seen this either, had you? No, um, I think I'd heard you talking about it, and the fact that it was kind of like teen romance comedy drama with horror thrown in kind of pushed me away from it. But then I'm like, man, I line up with Bo's taste in a lot of stuff. Mm. But, but this was one of those things where I was kind of like apprehensive about watching it. And then I kind of wanted to watch it, but I just kind of needed that little extra nudge and doing this show just was all it took. And I'm really glad that I actually watched it. I will just, I'm going to spill the beans now. I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. I really, really liked it. So I'm glad that it was what you picked for us to talk about. I'm glad yeah. you enjoyed the nudge. I also enjoyed the nudge. My nudge, not your nudge, Court. That's a separate thing. But I enjoyed <laughs> my nudge uh, because, yeah, this was a really, really great film. Um, and uh, it was very different to how I thought. I didn't really have an expectation going in. I kind of knew the basic premise. But it was um, the style of it and, like, the script of it and things was very different to... Um, what I had had kind of pictured in my head and um, it was way better than what it pictured in my head. Um, and this is why I don't make movies. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's really good. Yeah, just to get the bona fides out of the way, the, it's based on a novel, which I have yet to read, although it might be next on my list, actually, after I'm, <laughs> I'm in the middle of Dope Sick right now. Nice. Uh, or towards the end of Dope Sick, because, you know, you just want to read something light at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And, and there's nothing better than an expose of uh, how the opioid epidemic has <laughs> run through America's heartland. Yeah, yeah, it's real lighthearted shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think after I finish this, uh, after I finish Dope Sick, I may uh, dive into the novel. Because I'm curious mm-hmm. how that reads after well, having I've seen the movie someone... a couple of times. Because I posted that I was watching this all over the uh, the many, many groups that I'm part of. Um, it's really funny when I go out of doing that and then I go to my news feed because it always posts the last thing that you've posted. And it's just this stream of the same poster going up my, my news feed. Uh, but someone on one of those groups um, had uh, had said that the book was really good and that I should check it out. And if I like the film, then I'd be very happy with the book kind of thing. So it is now on my to be read pile also. Excellent. Um Yeah. So, uh, Aaron, St- Aaron Starmer, uh, as I said, is, is the author of that book and it's written and directed by a guy named Brian Duffield, who has only directed this, even though he's attached to, uh, a couple of other films to, um, to direct, but this is a solid first film. Sorry to interrupt, but Jesus, this is a really solid first film. Well, and yeah, then I was surprised to hear that. He wrote the babysitter, the Netflix movie. Really? Yeah. That makes sense. He also wrote Underwater, 
the Kristen, uh, Kristen Stewart. Oh, I have movie. yet to see that one. That's it's supposed rad. to be good as well, though. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it's good. I've heard it's good. And then also wrote uh, Love and Monsters, which totally is very similar to this in a lot of ways. Would also fit for this show at some point, I think. Yeah, yeah. For I don't sure. know that one. Um, oh, it's it's a it's a great little film. Yeah. Okay. It's a a, a very sweet. And we'll talk about that another time. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> then, of course, wrote and directed this and is writing and directing his next film, which is called Vivian Hasn't Been Herself Lately, which is uh, sounds like a bit like a haunted house kind of thing. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so like the guy has a pretty impressive track record. Yeah. Uh, Not to be snubbed at. Yeah. Yeah. Like, boy, what I wouldn't give for this guy's career right now. Um, mm hmm. And it turns out what I wouldn't give is nothing. I would give <laughs> literally anything. Uh, my family, friends, whatever. Uh, but so Spontaneous uh, came out in 2020. It's, it just came out last year. And as, as I mentioned up top, like I saw this and just kind of fell in love with it. I think maybe the strength of the movie is its characters. And it. I, I always feel good about a movie when you can say that. We're like, oh, the people in the movie are people that you care about and root for. Yeah. And, and that's kind of tough to do. But the the style of the film is very first person. Like, the main character is a, a girl named Mara. And it's very much her talking to us, the audience, through much of the movie and kind of explaining what's going on. Uh, which I like. I like the fact that it's this direct conversation between her and, and us. And to pair with this film, the theme that we are, are tackling tonight is the the crux of this movie, which is young love, first love, that kind of uh, all-encompassing, like, I fell in love for the first time, and, and holy shit, I've been gobsmacked by it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and and i think this movie does a terrific job of of capturing what that's like and how that feels yeah i i would agree with that definitely that yeah i would agree <laughs> i know right. we're gonna get into it later so i'm yeah. not gonna say right. too much <laughs> so we'll we'll kind of jump into the movie itself and it starts with a bang <laughs> 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 um <laughs> I, I just really realized I'm that. just listening to you guys like I'm listening to the podcast and I should probably like chime in a little bit more. <laughs> uh, feel free. Sometimes I sometimes I do the same thing where Kate will start telling a story and I just uh -huh. like chin on hands like, uh-huh. And <laughs> I tell, me more, have, tell me more. <laughs> it's because you have no choice. Because <laughs> I don't stop. Uh, I, don't, I have this really great ability where I can talk and breathe through my nose. So like <laughs> I just <laughs> Well, that's why there ain't no party like a Kate party. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree that um, the coming of age part of the love story where it's sort of like a first love or at least a first real love. Because sometimes you think you had a relationship, but mm. like it, the, the way that these kids actually experience love, it really does just kind of happen to them. And they're literally shocked. It's almost like their relationship is a car wreck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where they just they just kind of collide into each other, and um, it it has to happen so suddenly because of the circumstances surrounding their lives mm. that um, it's like this accelerated meet cute relationship that develops and goes into full blown actual love in yeah. a, in a very realistic way. And again, we can talk about that too. But like, I really felt this relationship as it was developing, even though things seemed to move extremely fast to me, um, I understood why, because A, it's a movie, and then B, because these kids have no time. They have they have no idea what's going to happen. And I liked the metaphor of that, um, specifically for falling in love, because in order for it to work, you do kind of have to feel like there's no time left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, because you, you just have to kind of go for it. And I think... This meet cute that happens in the film is actually a perfect example of lighting a fire under somebody's ass, which just happens to be composed of the guts of your classmate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> and that's um, what what happens at the very beginning of the movie is our, our main character, Mara, is played by 
the terrific Catherine Langford in this. Amazing. Oh, she's so great. I really love 13 Reasons Why. I don't care at me if you want. Um, and so it was really cool to see her because I hadn't really seen her in anything else, but I really enjoyed her performance uh, in in that. And um, so it was really cool to see her in, in something like this, which is still very... Um, uh, is very kind of pertinent with its message and things but it was cool to kind of see her in a more like use comedy more and things and just sort of expand out that way too yeah As she's to being very, very depressed all the time <laughs> I, I haven't seen 13 reasons why so i can't speak to that although I she's think the she's... one who commits suicide and leaves the tapes oh no <laughs> shit she's amazing yeah. in uh knives out as well as meg yeah, oh, yeah think... no, that's right yeah she's Oh. yeah she I fucking steals that, that movie that. every scene she's mm. in she steals like she's really that good in that movie yeah. she's just got one of those faces that just draw your attention i think like you can't help but look at her like and it's i mean she's very beautiful it's not because like like in a oh my god you're so fit i can't take my eyes off you kind of way but just she has a presence um and she just she just draws your attention i think yeah and she has especially her character in this movie there's an irreverence to her like she is <sighs> yes she is really nerdy in her own way like she uh drops a lot of references and things like that but she's also like a little too cool for school uh is how we would describe it back in the 1940s um (laughs) where well that's every teenager they always think that they are you know better than all this or they're done with all this or they're over all of this because it's just angsty that's just yeah. being a teenager. Yeah, but yeah. She, she's also willing to voice that as opposed to like she she's willing to take the hit for the things that she believes and says. Yeah, like she doesn't she genuinely just doesn't see I don't want to say doesn't give a shit in terms of she doesn't care, but like she genuinely as you say, yeah, she has this irreverence about her. Like I she became my hero when the guy puts his arm around her and she bites his hand. <laughs> right. I was just like was Yes. <laughs> um I was like, I wish I had the nerve to do something like that. Of course now I wouldn't dare bite anyone's hand um for fear of what I'd contract. Um but um but yeah, back in the day I wish I could have done that to some people and elbow to the ribs whenever they're trying to pull you in like that works just as well so you don't have to worry about biting okay cool cool yeah i will keep that in mind stun gun uh yeah which i've built up a fair tolerance to but most people (laughs) haven't taken the time oh she was uh, in a diner too she could have just picked up a fork and stabbed his fucking hand yeah i mean that's true but i feel like the way that she did it was just a lot more efficient you had less time to to move unfortunately i don't really have many opportunities of unwanted attention anymore since <laughs> i am now old and decrepit <laughs> i hear you I think, I think i'm still younger than you two though so maybe I oh stop for sure talking. <laughs> oh yeah like you're young you're old and decrepit and we're just broke down at this point like but in fairness though guys reach their peak a lot later than women like i'm starting it's all downhill for me now whereas guys are just coming into their peak around like you know mid to late late 30s and early 40s that's like when they're at their prime whereas now it's just like it's just i'm done done <laughs> here i was told that it was actually at 18 mm. what, that's, I, that's what sexual women, peak, what? but developmentally yeah. <laughs> oh i just mean in terms of like <laughs> no no bo is right looks. men men do not really become developed <laughs> as human beings until their midlife yeah yeah a hundred i i, I definitely <laughs> see that <laughs> Uh, and yeah, I sure. and I would say, like as someone who is dating a, a woman who is uh, forty eight, you know, like she's a, a, as beautiful a woman as I've ever encountered. So, oh, um, oh, so sweet. Yeah, He's well, so sweet. you know, I'm a romantic. Um, you are. You are such a romantic. But so this movie kicks off with the the irreverent Mara uh, in class one day. She drops her pen leans down and then <laughs> one of her classmates explodes and yep. and like it doesn't blow up the clothes or anything and also probably worth getting out of the way right now this movie is a hundred percent a metaphor for school shootings oh god yeah and yeah as what <laughs> so as, as, pretends to be shocked <laughs> yeah uh, well, and Court and I both live in the U.S. where, like, w- this is homegrown violence for us. Mm, and and yeah. I, I think this was maybe the first movie that forced me to think about 
what it's like to grow up in the generation of school shootings yeah where where the the larger anxiety that mara has in this movie is a genuine one they're like it's real it's not just mm. the 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 made up you know uh, exploding classmates one but it's the idea of like yeah somebody could just walk into the school and shoot five or six of your classmates in, including your friends and people you love yeah and, and that's just a thing that you live with and you don't know who and there's no control and there's nothing you can do or predict it's terrifying yeah and and we'll get to the end of the movie where it kind of sums up the philosophy of that in a in a really wonderful way i think but but yeah so she uh the, this classmate explodes and everybody runs off and are basically taken to uh a holding cell mm. where they're they're kind of questioned about what might have happened and so forth and uh and that's kind of the inciting incident which leads to the text message that she gets that night um, that's right the and the unsolicited pic. dick pic yeah <laughs> right it, an unsolicited dick pic and it's not of course a penis uh it is richard dixon followed which could be argued is technically a penis true yeah uh and it's followed by and he's a, crooked the, the crooked <laughs> line is the one that gets me is, yeah sorry oh, it's crooked it's yeah so that's good that is totally where whoever was texting her kind of got her charmed. You could see it in Mara's eyes where she's like, okay, this that was clever. And she kind of giggles and she kind of is interested in the attention as well. Like the, the, the picture and then the I'm sorry, it's crooked or whatever. Like that is what really kind of starts her on the path, I think, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think um, it's I. this is a thing like, you know, people I mean, it doesn't help that I mean, hmm. Yeah, I think I probably would have had a crush on him at that age. Um, like he, he's, you know, he's not ugly or anything. But there is this whole thing of like, if you can make a woman laugh, like that's half the battle. Um, because don't can... I know it? <laughs> and we can, you know, if like, yeah, if that's like you have that that right level of kind of charm and whatever, then that can be kind of. And if you have that that bounce and that connection where you can just vibe off each other it's like the sexiest thing on earth like it was it's so funny because their relationship in a way at least to begin with I mean definitely my relationship with this guy definitely did not end <laughs> the way that theirs does um but um the one of like my first real love uh was very much kind of like this um in the respect that everything kind of happened well mm, you could say actually there was about a year's worth of foreplay but like but once we actually got together everything happened very very fast and we spent all of our time but we also had this instant thing of like just we got each other's sense of humor we like you know interacted in a way that even his friends didn't couldn't understand you know and all of these kinds of stuff so like it was watching this and and obviously I was watching this with like a mind of like how does this have I got stories of this you know um but it was very easy to kind of relate this to my first love just because of that kind of whirlwind emotion um which I think is probably like I mean I only had puppy love once you know I can't speak for everyone but it seems to be that is a kind of that is kind of how it goes with your first love. It is very kind of whirlwind and everything's very heightened because you're a teenager and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it was it was really easy to kind of like put that, put their situation in on a, at least on a surface level, obviously, like we didn't have to deal with any kind of violence in that way. But um, well, no, we had to deal with some violence actually, but not in a, oh, not in that way. That's a, <laughs> that's a story I'll tell probably later. Um <laughs> But um, anyways, yeah, so like it was kind of, it was very easy because I think that, and it's kind of what we're going back to what you were saying, Court, is that the relationship that those two have is very genuine um, and and authentic and you do feel that. And especially kids at that age, it it does have that um, that very kind of elevated and heightened sense of, of emotion, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, when they're in that diner, when they when he finally actually like reveals to him to her that he is the one that's been sending her unsolicited dick pics <laughs> <laughs> and rather crooked ones at that. Um yeah. 
when he reveals that to her and they have that, it's not necessarily the meet cute, but like he just starts telling her and like, you can tell that they've both had a crush on each other from a distance because that, that shock of the reveal of like, where she's like, Oh my God, it's you. And like it, it, on her face, at least the way that the actress seems to play it, it mm. appears that she is actually pleasantly shocked in that she's like oh my god i can't believe this is happening like this guy that i have a crush on you know likes me too mm. and then when she kind of starts flirting back with him and it starts going really really well and he kind of can feel that and they start that vibe back and forth with the joking you yeah. can kind of see it on their faces where they're like oh my god this is going way better than i could have ever imagined and that is kind of the crux of that first love that like so many of us would love to have happen whenever everything just starts to click and it feels like it's going into place. It's like the first time you kind of understand how the world works almost because things just feel like it's, it, it, it just feels like it's coming together. And when you find another person that matches you so well, like these two do um, yeah. that, that back and forth that you have in that, that sort of like mutual attraction and just that, that giddy energy that they have that's going back and forth is something that is superbly special. Um, I can't say that my first love was necessarily like that for how this film is going because they go super intense. Um, but I do know that that clicking and that vibing and, and just having a good time laughing and giggling and, and just kind of getting each other and understanding each other and having that, I don't know that that electric charge where you're just drawn to each other and there's a third person just sitting there in the booth like guys go somewhere and get a room this is gross. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I've definitely I definitely had that part of it with my first love. But that that vibing back and forth and just having that constant witty banner, I've only ever had that with my wife with all of the Aww. other relationships that I've had. And that is what makes it absolutely special to me. Now that I've said that, let me talk about my actual first love. <laughs> <laughs> just in case my wife ever listens to this i want her to know that what we have is way more special than any other relationship i've ever had i thought that would probably have been obvious but just so the rest of the world knows it too before i tell the story of my first life noted Bo, yeah. edit that bit out later yeah I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna cut everything out except uh the apology now and yeah i <laughs> And and the kind of where we are in the movie, yeah. Uh, as Court was saying, uh, the this guy Dylan uh, shows up, played by Charlie Plummer, who was also just charming as shit. Um, and he shows up, and I, I almost called it a pro move, and it's not that; it's just he's a nice guy. Yeah. Where uh, Mara is with Tess, her best friend, and there's a whole. I love thing. Tess. Oh, uh, their relationship is terrific oh. as well. Like they are. From early on, they decide that they're just going to be best friends, and then they are. Yeah, I love it. It's so pure. And they talk about how uh, they saw uh, this old couple, or not a couple, but these two old women yeah, uh, who had rented a beach house and were drinking, you know, margaritas. With and like their smoking the hookah. Yeah, smoking a hookah with their toes in the sand. And mm -hmm. Grace and Frankie. Yeah, and they, they resolve <laughs> at that point that's going to be us one day. We are going to be the kind of friends that end up sitting on this porch uh, on the beach with each other, smoking a hookah and, and having our toes in the sand. And when Dylan comes up, like Court was saying, Tess, she doesn't get completely sidelined. Like there's no third wheel kind of vibe. I, I think in this movie, but it's just the story is about Dylan and Mara, not Mara and Tess necessarily. Yeah. Um, but that does happen when you get into a first relationship, though, where a friend kind of disappears on you because they spend all of their free time with their new love. I've done that to people and I've had yeah. people do that to me. It's natural. And I think but it seems to me that Tess is uh, first off, she's she's confident enough in, and comfortable enough in their friendship to not be threatened. But also like she just I mean, both of them genuinely seem especially Tess seemed to have like an a, like a an understanding sort of beyond her years in terms of yeah this is this is what happens that's cool it doesn't affect our friendship we're still good you know and it's like all right he's a he seems an all right guy and you go and and it's almost as well like that bit you're about to get to Bo um where um 
because she's been doing shrooms. <laughs> yeah, has has taken a, a, a Herculean dose of mushroom. Like tea. insane, and um, which yeah, like I feel like she needs to listen to Tess when Tess is going. This is not the time to start shrooms after a funeral where you are feeling all kinds of ways and not good times either like real like confusing and distressing times maybe don't start shrooms um i disagree (laughs) really um really yeah specifically for shrooms and the reason why now everybody sit sit down here and grab a grab a nice cup of of tea okay Um, (laughs) okay, because i'm here you're saying tea no, no, because I actually always have everybody sip tea whenever I'm about to talk about shrooms because shrooms and tea are like, oh, hand yeah, hand of going course. Okay, yes. All right. So shrooms actually are a warmer, uh, happier kind of hallucination and are actually being used to treat depression. So in this circumstance, after a funeral, taking a moderate to lower dose of mushrooms to try to alleviate some of those symptoms and maybe feel a little bit better and a little bit more jovial, I absolutely do agree with. However, Mara's <laughs> uh, ability to try and do all the shrooms that have ever existed, which, if the animation is to be believed, is probably more than an ounce of shrooms, which is way too much for one human being to consume. <laughs> and it's no wonder she spent the rest of the night vomiting. But but it is the psychosyllabin or whatever it is, the, the active ingredient that is in mushrooms actually is being used to treat depression. Is it? I, well, that is, yeah. that is an education because I thought it was one of those ones where, because I've never taken shrooms. Um, it, I thought it was one of those ones where um, you have to be in the right mindset. You know, like if you drop acid or you do MDMA or something like you have, if you're not in that quite right mindset. I mean, also I've heard anyway. Um, <laughs> the, um <laughs> Like is it can it can kind of fuck you up a bit, but that's not the case with shrooms. Well, let's say that you are someone who is um, predisposed to acting erratically or doing something extremely dangerous. Uh huh. Yeah, you probably shouldn't do shrooms after a funeral or in a bad mood or probably any kind of hallucinogen or or anything that really limits your capacity to understand that what you're doing is wrong. You right. Know? Right. That's 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 bad. Yes. But someone like in Mara's case, where she's well-adjusted and she just needs a reset button, emotionally speaking, mm-hmm. that's the kind of person that that type of treatment, I believe, would be designed for. Oh, okay, cool. All right, then. Well, Tess, sit down. Yep. <laughs> and, yeah, and but again, Tess is right about the excessive amount that Mara is yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to stress that. And so Dylan does the good guy thing here of sees that this girl that he likes is having a time of it and so he just hangs with her and he you know holds her hair when she throws up and they Mm -hmm. go on a walk and when she throws up again he holds her hair again and and she has this vision of multiple dylans all around (laughs) which is very funny yeah she's like you two ought to kiss and he's like like, how how do i do that yeah right (laughs) And then she's out? like, with tongues. <laughs> like, <laughs> <duh>. <laughs> yeah. But I just, what I love about him, because he's such a puppy dog. And not in a, you know, he, it, this is the, again, the, the real kind of skill with not only the script, but also the acting. They could be so gross, you know, like, oh God, can you not? Like, because he is quite a puppy dog, but it's it's just cute it's just very sweet that you know when she says like do you want to come with me to the girls bathroom and Tess quite rightly um establishes it's not to make out but because she's had too much shrooms and she now needs to throw up um because and that's again it's the little things like her best friend will just know exactly what she means whereas someone who doesn't know her so well may not um and little things like that that I love about their friendship but what I love is how when he realizes her true intention of why she wants him to go to the bathroom with her, he seems not only relieved, but really happy <laughs> to <laughs> like the thought of making out with her because obviously he's, he's had this crush on her for so long. It's probably quite an intimidating thought at this point, but yeah, I can hold back your hair. Sure. I can be your knight in shining armor kind of thing. And he genuinely seems like really happy and relieved that he, he gets to do that instead of making out with her. And it was that moment then it wasn't even the unsolicited dick pics for once, um, that I fell in love with him. Um, it was, it was that moment. I was just like, you are, you are just too cute and I like you, you know? So, um, yeah, that was a really nice moment. I thought. 
Can I just jump in here if I have a holding back hair with someone that you just found out likes you uh, yeah, yeah, while they vomit it. story? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I'm sorry to out you, honey, but my wife, um, when we had been friends, okay, we were we were kind of friends that fell in love. That's why we've always vibed so well together and all of that. Um, we were having a, a party, like the, the group of friends in college, and she had had too much to drink and, and she was getting rather, rather sick. And I was holding back her hair while she vomited. And I took care of her um, while she tried to like sleep it off and made sure she got plenty of water and everything for like the rest of the party. Everybody oh. everybody else just kind of abandoned, you know, and went somewhere else. And, and I was just kind of keeping an eye on her. And I watched her for the entirety of the night. And when she fell asleep on the floor, I fell asleep just keeping an eye on her uh, as well. And... um then when we woke up, I took her back to her room and everything like that. And so that kind of, that was the night where I guess she used the alcohol to get up the courage to tell me that she liked me too. But that's kind of how it happened. And then she started oh. getting sick right after she told me she liked me. She started getting <laughs> sick. I don't know how that should make me feel, but oh, that's really oh. nice. Yeah. I and then the... I... Oh, sorry, Kyle. Yeah, and I was just going to say, and I, I did, I spent the night taking care of her much like what he did here. So when that happened, I kind of rolled a little bit of a tear watching the movie. I was surprised. Oh my gosh, Colt, you're so cute. That's so, so sweet. I have um, a very less cute story about like my partner trying to be sincere and me just throwing up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, so this is, uh, yeah, fuck it. This is my current partner. Um and we had been together for about five weeks and two of those weeks I'd been in Jamaica and um I got back and so me and my flatmate were like I haven't seen you in two weeks which for us was like loads um and let's go out and and party so we did and um she and like I knew that I was seeing my partner afterwards and I thought that I was going over to his he was going to pick us up and drop my flatmate home and then we were going to head over to his which if I'd really thought about it yeah that probably wasn't the best idea because he lives all the way across the city um from ours um so like I don't know why I thought that was the plan and he knew the actual plan which was he was going to stay at mine um but my flatmate had pulled so I was like, well, we only live in a tiny little flat and our bedrooms are right next to each other. So that's that's not happening. Um, and so we ended up driving back to his, but on the way, so he was kind of annoyed about that because he was like, I've just driven all the way across town to drive all the way back again, just so that, because your mate pulled, but okay. Um, and then also, I think he was also annoyed because it became abundantly clear that he was not going to get any that night. Because I was so trashed. I was pure white girl trashed. Um, (laughs) Like my flatmate and the guy that she pulled got a clear view of everything I'd eaten that day when I got out of the car because my skirt had ridden up over my ass. Um, And (laughs) any any typical shit like that, that basically that went down. Um, On the way back, um, I had to get him to pull over because I was throwing up everywhere. Um, cause it's really classy. Um, and then when we, and then basically I don't even remember getting back to his and, um, and I passed out. And then like the next day I had that panic where you check your bank account. And then I remembered that I bought the entire, everyone who was at the bar, I bought a round of drinks because I'd lost my phone and then someone had found it and I couldn't remember who it was. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to buy everyone a drink. Um, and then I had no money the next day and I think it was maybe three days past payday. Um, and, uh, so I was like really freaking out about that. I had a headache for days. Like it was just awful. I felt nauseous and sick and he, and my partner had like woken up and he had like made me a cup of tea and he'd got me some painkillers and, you know, glass of water and everything. And he'd obviously taken care of me because I was in like actually like sleeping clothes and stuff instead of just what I'd worn the night before and things. And my, my partner does find it very difficult to kind of open up, um, and be vulnerable. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's kind of the guy who kind of keeps everything in. <clears throat> and he's like trying to tell me basically that he loves me for the first time. 
and he's but he's kind of not gearing up to say it yet he's just kind of going like you know I really like you you know the thing you know when you like you're trying to get there and you're kind of testing the waters and like you know I really like you and you know I think that the time we spent together has been really special and you know and all of this kind of stuff and I'm just like cool and (laughs) and then like he finishes this whole thing about how much he likes me and everything and I just sort of look at him bleary eyed and I'm just like if you got any more aspirin and that's literally (laughs) all I say and he's just like yeah and he just like looks and he's just like right yeah I'll get you some and then bless him he took me back to mine and he bought me a massive pizza along the way and then sat with me in my equally hungover housemate um and I think watched sex in the city with us for like three hours and then eventually that night got the courage to tell me that he loves me even after all of that. And I was like, you know what? I really think I really believe you <laughs> because I didn't think you would have put up with all of this shit for the last 12 hours if you didn't. <laughs> you know? And I did tell him I loved him back. Um, so we got there eventually. But yeah, how, that morning. How it was could just... you not after all of that? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine if I was just like, oh, no. Yeah, we need to break up. <laughs> Like the pizza was great and I had a good time, but, um, yeah. (laughs) I wonder if there's something like even biological about that of just, if somebody takes care of you when you're vulnerable, I just think that makes them instantly more attractive. A hundred percent. It's like, you know, when you see those really like amazingly good looking guys, you guys know what I'm talking about. And, and oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. With, uh, and they're holding like a puppy or a baby in their like naked manly muscle arms and it's just like my ovaries explode I'm just like oh my god because it's like you're showing vulnerability but you're still so tough my my wife has a photo of me (laughs) snuggled up with one of our cats um and petting her with um my tattoo arm just like hold like she's curled up in my tattoo arm and I'm holding her like that and petting her And she's talking about to me about how that's like the sexiest thing in the world. And I'm like, yeah, all right. And she's literally like, no, you can't have that. You cannot show that to anybody else ever. And I'm not even sure I'm allowed to talk about it. So I may be in trouble now. (laughs) No, no, but I 100% get where your wife's coming from. It is this like the kind of typical tough looking guy. Like, and it is, it's a silly stereotype, but like, you know, that, that kind of thing that we're all kind of like, have in our head of like what is a quote unquote tough guy but then they're showing extreme vulnerability and they're like in touch with their like softer side oh my god there is nothing more attractive yes what, what's your thought on it Bo? <laughs> i mean no you're like my girlfriend loves to see me playing with my nephew you know Aww. like that's a thing that she she really enjoys but to go back oh yeah in, we've gone deep into the track. past uh so my first love was in high school probably younger than the ages of our characters here but i did go on to like live with her after high school and stuff so it was it lasted for a bit neither of us exploded as it happened that's Um, good although not not into a pile of guts anyway yeah i mean i was gonna say it's gonna be a few explosions though right uh there were a handful sure yeah Um, a handful hey mostly handfuls eh hey 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 (laughs) Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, so, but it, like, <laughs> this was one of those things, like we were talking about before, of when you kind of vibe with somebody. And I was just a fucking emotional mess until about mm, five years ago. So, same, only about five months ago. Yeah. So, starting at the age of, say, six till then, it was just a train wreck. And uh, it, it was just, a, you know, in the interest of of being honest about things on this show it was there was a lot of childhood trauma and stuff like that like i had a real bad way of things for a long time and so there wasn't a lot of love in in the house where i grew up and then i met this girl in high school and we had the same sense of humor so we started making each other laugh and that's kind of how it started but i had no skills whatsoever in terms of here is how you appropriately display this you know (laughs) like i didn't i didn't do dick pics or nothing because at the time that wasn't an option uh and i wouldn't have anyway but i so what i did and this is a story like i'm still friends with her and she tells this story to this day embarrassingly 
<laughs> but so what I did was the only thing I could think of that would be a, a gesture that was more than friendly. And mm-hmm. so I ended up bringing her a bunch of cookies that I'd baked for her. Aww. Aww. And no one's ever baked me cookies in like a romantic way. Yeah, well, it was the only <laughs> it was the only thing that I kind of knew to do. It was the only thing that was kind of good at that I could think of other than writing. And I then I started doing that. I started writing a, her letters after that. And uh but that was the thing. It was like this this really tentative sort of like I I really like you. I don't know how to say that. I'm also like incredibly wounded in a lot of ways and you know trying to you know I I didn't have the the skills to say that to another person but it was just kind of obvious and and to her credit god bless her she was like I, you know we have a good time together and I I I know what you're going through because she had some some trouble uh, at home as well and and so that was our first love where we kind of found refuge in one another and it we really like fell in love hard we were we were both you know I, like i was a, a a little bit older than her but not by much and and yeah it was that kind of intense like oh well things are going to be okay now you know like i found this person that can help me make sense of all this shit that doesn't make sense and it was really wonderful. Uh, so I like, you know, uh, for all the its awkwardness and all of that, like the first time that I fell in love, it was it was wonderful. I had I had a great time. And and it was very like it was passionate. It was I think I think both of us, it was the first time we'd ever had sex with anybody and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it was like all these firsts for both of us. And uh, and she was just the best person in the world. Like I said, we're still friends to this day. I can call her up right now, and she'll give me shit. Um, oh. So yeah, it was just the best that you could kind of share all of that experience with someone. And to this day, I can. You know, like I I can still uh give her a ring and and sort of talk about those old times and, and whatnot. Um. So yeah, you know, like first love is really. Uh, for me, at least, it was really kind of wonderful and special, and I I really adored it. It was uh, impassionate. Holy shit. I mean, just because when you're that age, that's how your brain yeah. works. Yeah, definitely. But, yeah, I, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> with, with mine, mine was um, less sweet um, and less heartfelt, although I definitely, like, fell heavy and hard and quickly. Um but <laughs> I was, uh, so I was like, how was that? I was, I was 15 when I first met him and he was 16. Uh, and I had met him at a party I was holding. Um, it was like in between, like, it was like, here's a party for everyone in my year at school before we head into our final year. And we have to really kind of put our heads down, crack on. And he was actually the boyfriend of one of my not really close friends but we were like you know we would say hi and you know hang out at parties or whatever and um we just like immediately had this like chemistry but he was like obviously with my kind of friend and um we obviously didn't do anything as a result and he was like uh but he was also kind of like still into her and stuff he was like you know um and over a period of about nine months me and him just hung out more and more and more and it got to a point where people thought we were a couple even when we weren't like even though we weren't and yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and like and we wouldn't even have to even be near each other like um there was just this electricity and I felt really bad one time because um this his girlfriend Kate, we were like chatting at lunch at school and he as she was just like oh I'm not gonna get to see him until Thursday it's like Monday so I'm not gonna get to see him till Thursday and I'm like oh why am because because he's seeing me for the next three days you know um and I got on really well with all of his friends I'm actually still friends with him and a few others as well um and 
yeah and so and we all got on like hugely well and we all just hung out as one big group and stuff so it was it was kind of like it's okay to hang out with him because we're all hanging out in a group together it, it does you know it's fine it's safe um but then me and him used to hang out a little bit more and more on just on our own and um and it got to a point where we kind of like admitted our feelings for each other but he was like but I'm I still have feelings for my girlfriend and I like you know I'm I feel like I'm really torn. I don't know what to do. And she's going through a really hard time and I don't want to add to this and all the rest of it. And I was like, okay, look, let's just not then. We'll just, you know, we'll just be friends and that's cool. And then w the one time me and him and her hung out, um, things got a little bit between all three of us. Whoa. And then, yeah. <laughs> well, bow -wow. Mm, well, uh, they both stayed over and, um, I remember I was waking up and I was, <laughs> lol, imagery, in the middle of them. And, um, she basically confessed that she was gay and she was in love with me. Wow. And, yeah, and she was with him because she didn't feel comfortable about telling her friends that she was gay because this was back in, like, the early 2000s where, you know, there was still a bit of prejudice and stuff. Um, anyway, so it turns out he wasn't sleeping. So he heard all of this. And basically that night me and him banged <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> Um, and funny you should say about like the third wheel, it was at my friend's house and, um, there was a whole bunch of us, we were all staying over and we all kind of got a bit messy and we all crashed and me and him were in the living room and we thought that one of our other friends who was asleep on the sofa was asleep. Turns out he wasn't. Turns out not only did he get up, he got up several times. One, to go get a drink. Two, to go get his earphones. Three guesses as to why. And then three, to turn off the TV. And I did not notice at all because I had my back to him. And then the next day, he proceeded to do impressions of me on the bus to his friends all the way to the fucking next town over. Oh so, my God. Yeah. I don't know why I'm still friends with him, honestly. <laughs> so, all right. A, a couple of questions. F okay. Follow-up questions, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what happened with the girl who confessed that she well, was attracted to you well so the guy the guy in question um was a bit of an idiot and he the next day after we had like wow wow uh -huh. um took her out on a date oh uh, all right i don't got understand to, any of this now got to the end of the date dropped her back at her house and then left it with Oh, by the way, me and Kate shagged last night. So, huh. yeah, mm -hmm. not the smartest of guys, honestly. And so the next day, I don't know any of this. I don't know that he's taken her out. I don't know that he's told her in such a brutal way, no less. Um, and my... Uh, my uncle was staying with us at the time and he doesn't know anyone from anyone. So if someone just knocks on the door and says, hi, I'm Kate's friend, he's going to let them up. Sure. So she came over and she's like, yeah, hi, I'm Kate's friend. And my uncle just lets her up. And uh, <laughs> she basically, um, I think she just came in, barged into my bedroom and was just like, you fucking slept with my boyfriend or something like that. It's completely fair enough, uh, because I did. Um, right, but, but she, I, but you, like at this point, you knew that she wasn't attracted to him. Well, yeah, this was our kind of logic on it. I mean, afterwards, I was like, no, you need to talk to her. Like, you really do need to talk to her. This can't, I'm not, we, I can't do this while you're with her. This isn't right. But we were of the mind of like, because also as well, that night we were really drunk and really high. So it seemed like a good idea as well. Uh, sure. And also and we had young. been like, yeah, and we're young. We're like 16. And like, as well, like, we had held off for about a year with this attraction and we had held off 
because out of respect for her and I didn't want to get in the middle of that like that and then so it's basically her saying that was like the green light to just yeah go kind of thing um but yeah I I when I found out that's how he told her oh my god I was mortified but yeah so she comes in she's ranting and raging obviously um because it turns out later on because me and her eventually did make up and it was just kind of like it was her pride that was her aim she was like if you if he had broken up with me and then we'd done that she wouldn't have given a shit but the fact is that he was willing to do that and I was willing to do that while they were still together and I was supposed to be her friend and all this again totally understandable I get all of that um anyway so she has this little trick because she was also at like a bit of one of the you know like the rough kids you know uh, I don't know if you have this term over there I don't think you do but we call them chavs here uh, definitely not that. Like a, I know maybe the term. Like a, like a townie, I think. Okay, okay, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Townies like, yeah. we have, yeah. I think that is what I mean. I'm hoping that's what I mean anyway. um, So anyway, so she's like a little bit like, you know, rough. Really, really nice person, but she's like, you know, from the wrong side of the tracks kind of thing. And anyway, so she has this nifty little trick where she starts like clenching her fist with one hand and then sucker punches you with the other. Oh, that is pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> fell for that um and it literally just came out of nowhere and I fell back luckily I fell backwards onto my bed um so I didn't like you know really hurt myself and actually en it ended up being the punch was actually not that strong the bruise hurt more than the punch actually did but I think that's partly because of shock you know like I just didn't feel it because I just wasn't expecting it yeah, yeah and I yeah. ended up with this fucking welt all on my face as well um and anyways yeah and then uh so that's that's what happened and then me and him dated for you are you ready for this you know how long we dated for how long four months yeah oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> but we had a really great summer you know but i just i he was he was well he was 17 by that point and i was just very intensely in love with him and we just um spent all of our time and it just, i think it just got a bit much and then he ended up asking for me back a few months later um, and then we got back together and then we both broke it off after about two months because we were just like, nah. <laughs> but the thing of it was we've always maintained that friendship and we've always had like, we've always had this very similar sense of humor where we kind of like, we would call it Jenga jokes. So he would start off with a joke and then I'd build on it and then he'd build on it. So like, you know, when you have like going back to the film, um, you, know, you have like uh, Mara and um uh, Dylan and they're talking they're talking about the funeral and he's like oh that's the you know best funeral I've ever been she's saying it's best funeral I've been to he's like oh no my, my dad's was better and then she's like oh shit and then he's like you know they just have to do better next time yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and all of this it was it's that kind of level where we would kind of go to really dark places but we know but we would get it and we would make film references and we would make like comic book references and all of this kind of stuff so it was very and this is where like I was kind of like oh this is like this is like me and Andy this is like oh this is what we used to do oh this is fun you know I mean he didn't explode though like not like not, not his guts anyway not into a guts way yeah not in the guts way I feel like I should he, he definitely did um but um yeah so there was it's it's very much that and this is why like when I'm watching this film I can sort of see it's like this very organic but very kind of like heightened and very kind of like quick to get to a certain level um because it is is very much that puppy love when you were young um but yeah oh but just a a follow-up um the 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 other well technically I was the other woman <laughs> um but the uh the girlfriend in question she is very out and proud and she I believe is now married to her wife and um they have a dog and she's very very happy as far as I can tell oh congratulations um, so yeah so it's, it, it worked out well um and ultimately um me and him are still friends and stuff and me and her are Facebook friends and things so, so it was all fine it was all fine time heals all wounds yes well some wounds that don't heal. Uh, Does that is that my intro for my first love story? Then? No, but <laughs> go on. Heal? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I knew I had to kind of sandwich in there because I knew I, I felt Bo segueing back into movie review time, and I was like, "Well, everybody else got to tell theirs." Oh no, you tell yours, Cole. <laughs> okay, don't make me up so... to be the bad guy here, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, now in my particular first time love story i'm actually more like mara where i'm just marching to the beat of my own drum fuck everybody else around me to the point where like i'm just making quips about everything and i'm just so fucking over like i hated where i grew up i was fucking miserable and i hated everything and out of the blue 
in the summer of like fifth grade, this girl just comes into my life and starts talking to me. And she is almost exactly like a female version of Dylan, where she's just really jovial and happy and just basically like thinks I'm really funny and hilarious and just starts telling me this. And I met at somebody's like birthday pool party with her for some weird happenstance. I don't even know how that works. I don't even go into pools that much, but I just went for this one. And basically we met that summer and we just kind of had like this little meet cute laugh, you know, fun time that we, we got along and was just really happy. And she was super upbeat and really just thought I was the most hilarious thing in the world, I guess. And then sixth grade rolls around and she pretty much starts talking to me again. And she was the one that asked me out. This, this happens to me because I'm not the bold one. I wish I could have had the gumption that Dylan had to, to do that message like that, you know, or even the, 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 the cookie baking that Bo choose to do. Um, I didn't have that. I never really actually, well, and I can't say that I didn't chat up ladies. I never chatted up to begin a relationship before, like in order to actually start dating. Uh, and this was like kind of the first love and to have someone just out of the blue, like me when I barely even liked myself was like the most amazing thing that I had ever known where I'm like, really? What? Why? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like, and you know, ha just having somebody have this positive, upbeat, happy energy, just radiating radiating at you and just like so glad to have you around and thinking that you're such a delight and then having that sort of develop not necessarily into a friendship because it was sixth grade we were like 12 so that in that time uh the the 90s kids you know all, all these 32 years ago or 30 odd years ago when i'm when i'm 12 um it's it was kind of like you would start dating but you would be like just you would see each other and you wouldn't like flirt with other girls or or other guys or your respective other interests that you were in you just wouldn't flirt you would you would hold hands and all that kind of stuff maybe eventually kiss all of that kind of thing and this first love was also my first kiss um nice we were uh riding back from some type of some type of event it probably had something to do with my mother's church because everything i had to do in my goddamn life was had to do with my mother's fucking church but we're riding back from this sort of event, and she has been forbidden to kiss me in any way, shape, or form. Like, she's barely even allowed out of the house because her parents are so controlling, and they hate me so much because I am so fucking evil. Um, that has more to do with my family history than anything. It's not. It wasn't even my fault, you know? Uh, kind of like in the newest Halloween film, Lonnie's kid has all of the baggage from his family that he has to deal with, even though he didn't do anything. And then we see later on, he actually is a dick. Uh, that's kind of <laughs> what was happening to me where I grew up. Uh, but anyway, uh, so she's basically like forbidden. She's not allowed to kiss me in any way, shape, or form. We're barely allowed to hold hands. We only get to see each other whenever it's like, going to a function like this and my parents are always around and that kind of thing. Well, we're heading back and we're almost to her house and, you know, we're doing this like shy little like coy snuggling thing and almost kind of like the rubbing noses and just kind of talking and giggling and being all cute and sweet. And we're getting closer and closer and it just kind of goes to happen. And the very first kiss that I ever tried to plant on another human being landed in the space between the bottom of her chin and her bottom lip. <laughs> I kissed her right there. Oh. And then she grabs my face and plants a very passionate kiss on me, which I'm sure was very sloppy because we were 12. We were kids. Yeah. But uh, I'll never forget that because she told me that later on in life that the very first time I ever kissed her, she's like, right here. And she pointed it out to me. And I always kissed her there first for the entirety of our relationship after she pointed me that pointed that out to me. Like that was my thing that I did. I would just kiss her right there at the point of her chin and then give her an actual kiss. Oh my gosh, that's so sweet. Yeah. How long were you guys together? Well, uh for that age, it was an extremely long time. We outlasted several makeup breakups of several of our friends for quite a while. And we were together until 
it was the last day of seventh grade. Uh, she dumped me because she was getting into going to beaches and hanging out with people and doing things that I didn't like. And for reasons much like what Bo was talking about, um, that I'm not really ready to get into yet, I was a miserable bastard of a child. And um, my my youth really sucked. And she was definitely a highlight of it. And I totally understand now, even though I meant have been really heartbroken and resentful, like she needed to get away from me. What I was essentially doing was just energy vampiring her, vampiring her because I was pulling all of the like happiness and joy out of her life by being around. And I know that's what was happening because there were things that she wanted to do that I just was pulling back from and not wanting to do that I wasn't comfortable with. And I definitely was definitely holding her back. And I see that now. And, um, so when we actually did break up, it was the end of seventh grade and it was because she wanted to go off and do all this fun summer stuff. And I just wasn't into any of that. And so that's just kind of how it ended. And, uh, it was literally like being in a room where someone walks out with the last candle and there's nothing, no windows, no other light coming in and they close the door behind them. And that's what like so much of my time felt like after that was gone because there was so much joy and so much happiness in this one person that I couldn't deal with it and then there was none oh cool so you were like you did when again just sort of bring it back to the film with when uh what happens to Dylan happens when he goes kaboom um were you did you kind of like when you were watching this were you kind of like I get why I get like the emotions that uh, that Mara is going through in a way. Like obviously, like you know, this is all tied in with like school shootings and stuff as well. But and and that kind of existential fear. But in terms of like that loss that you're feeling, that way you don't feel like you have, you know, any real reason to do any of the things that you that you used to do. And like fuck it, I'm just gonna kind of spiral. Was that it, when you were watching this back? Was that something that you kind of like? I like I remember feeling that type of way or something akin to that type of way when you know when that happened to you when in seventh grade oh absolutely whenever she was gone and then what happens with Dylan whenever whenever she actually when Mara loses Dylan like that's exactly what it's like it's like you just wake up one day and your reason for even wanting to roll out of bed is gone yeah and and that's I want to stress to everyone that that is not on this person this was not her fault in any way shape or form relationships end um the fact that she was in a relationship with a mentally ill young man who put way more stock into a relationship than he should have and relied way too much on his own emotional well-being for that person especially at that young of an age again Mm. i'm a kid i didn't fucking know that's what i was doing you know, oh, like no, I wasn't, you have no I wasn't self-awareness like right, at that age. Right. But looking back at a four, as a 42 year old man watching spontaneous and thinking about the parallels between my first love and what has happened brought up a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not prepared to deal with. Oh, <laughs> yeah. awesome. But like, oh, but, man. but like, no, that's, that's what, that's what film is supposed to do. I just want to yeah. feel something. And this film did that. It made me feel that it made me think about that. It made me self-actualize. I was a bastard at some points in my life. And, and also like, I don't want to make it sound like I, I only took because I did give, um, she blames me for the big laugh lines that she has on the side of her face. She (laughs) said that before we started dating, those did not exist. And they were there within three to four months of us dating. She did tell me that, that that's my fault. And that she'll always, that's something you want to be responsible for. I feel. Yeah. Right. And she's like, she'll, she told me she would always think of me with those and we were friends we did become friends we we did get along i mean this was like we we broke up in like seventh grade by the time we were in like ninth grade we were totally fine and it wasn't because i wasn't able to deal with it it was just i needed to stay away from her because i knew that was healthier for everybody i at least was self-aware enough at like 12 and 13 years old where i'm like no you you gotta you gotta kick this like it's fucking heroin you just got to you know go to na (laughs) get away from this you're not gonna get that fix again and it took me so goddamn long after that to be that vulnerable again and to be that open. And it was from that point on that I became just a giant male whore. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I literally would just like, I, you know, if, if somebody even showed any kind of interest in me at all, I was like, all right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. I think like that's, again, that's a natural thing. Okay, so just from my own understanding, uh, how old are you for seventh grade in America? 12, 11 or 12 years old, depending upon when you're born. Um, right. Let you in. Yeah. Oh, okay. So same. Okay. Yeah. So it's like 11, 12 here as well. Well, well, 12, like 11 or 12 is like seventh or sixth grade. And then like seventh grade is like 12 or 13, give or take. Like right. you're turning 12 to 13. Oh, so okay. It's, so basically we dated from the time that we were 12 until we were about 14 is when it ended. Okay. Right. Okay. And then like that was a, a grieving period. And then like age 15 or whatever, you like went to whore town. Oh, no, no, no. My grieving period was Whore Town, and it lasted until I met my wife. Oh. Going to Whore Town. <laughs> yeah. It's, I'm I mean, sorry, is it similar to Hooker a Island? Great, it's a temptation I, I, song. I, I literally sought out nothing but doomed relationships, which is kind of why I wanted to talk about... Uh, <laughs> what was it I was going to pick? Um, oh, or I... I can't remember what I suggested. I think it was uh, let the right one in is what I wanted to talk about because I wanted to talk right. about <laughs> setting up doomed relationships. But like, no, I, I purposely like I knew like I was like, I was like, oh, man, she's a whole mess. I, that's not going to work out. I got to date that. You know, like that was just kind of <laughs> that was what I was seeking. I just I just was like, I don't want it. I don't want to feel anything else ever again. That hurt way too much. Like I just was not emotionally ready to deal with it until about the time that I was going to college. It actually happened before then. But like like in the film, it was our senior year. By mm -hmm. the time I was like, you know, maybe I'm ready for love again. And then I'm like, well, what's the fucking point? I'm leaving all of you fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, bitches. It's like, right. So I just kept up with my the match on the gasoline. And yeah. <laughs> just kept up with my son. Yeah, I just kept up with my aberrant behavior. And then when I got to college, I decided to apply all of those like tender loving skills that I already had, but also stop being such a goddamn whore. <laughs> <laughs> I literally I went to college going I'm going to have a steady relationship and I'm going to try to love again now oh that's really cute though but everyone deals in it all their different uh, different ways and stuff and I feel like everyone needs for whatever motivation everyone needs to go through whore town in their life before settling you know I just feel like it's just apart from anything else you just find out so much about yourself during those times I think um like what you like what you don't like what works for you what kind of person you're into and it's just like a test run just a lot a lot of test runs you know <laughs> um so I feel like that you know people kind of go like oh my god I was such a slag back then or whatever and it's just like yeah and what like good you yeah. should be like when when else are you gonna and like I feel like it's a really healthy expression and and a really healthy kind of way to sort of work out what's what good for you because all otherwise otherwise what are you going to do you're going to go into like relationships and get into relationships that like you know are probably not going to work out for you to test what you want that's not that just creates more hurt so yeah just fuck about and have fun like for sure right you just don't want to like plant stakes in whore town whore town is a place that you vacation and then eventually you got to move on but there are there are far too many people who reach whore town and decide this is where they want to live and they they open up a little business and they have a <laughs> condo in whore town and they just never move on yeah uh, they start they start building a jacuzzi in their condo because it's whore town oh, and everyone has yeah. to have one. Oh, there's a jacuzzi in every home in whore town there's mm -hmm. water beds and jacuzzis <laughs> as far as the eye can see <laughs> they have those like rotating like beds with like the leopard print and Oh yeah, I'm, I'm basically I'm just I'm just uh, imagining Quagmire's house. Yeah, it mirrors on the ceiling in horror. Yeah. Town. Oh yeah, my yeah. god. Yeah, mirrors on the ceiling is just like that's the default for every condo you're gonna buy. <laughs> like that's just the setup. Like if you don't have mirrors on the ceiling, then are you even in horror town? <laughs> <laughs> the reverse of horror town, I think, is uh, when segue <laughs> when you have a bed that's pushed against the wall. <laughs> you know not even just pushed against the wall but pushed into like a corner yeah for sure yeah yeah. so yeah. you're like yeah yeah that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that that was <laughs> that was a thing i had to correct at one point um anyway <laughs> back to the movie <laughs> we're like 10 minutes in <laughs> yeah uh yeah well the rest of this is gonna go quick um it is it is 
but as yeah, quickly so, as the students do. Oh, nice. So yeah, so what happens is after <laughs> the first... I feel bad about joking about that now because it's actually based on really horrible things. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. But after... I sat around waiting and started taking bets with myself when it was going to happen, Kate. So don't feel so bad. I was actually, <laughs> I was actually encouraging it and cheering it on, waiting for more teens to explode. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So don't feel bad at all. Okay, good. <laughs> so after the first person pops, and then everybody's freaked out about it, but and then we have the you know the burgeoning relationship with mm-hmm. Dylan and Mira, and they go to a football game, the the homecoming game, <gasps> and there's the whole we love Cox bit which oh, i find I very that. funny where there are three players named we love and cox and once a game they are lined up in just the right way uh but as it <laughs> happens one love uh blows up and so now it turns out that this is not just a one-off thing and uh, the authorities get involved and yeah. and so uh there are people uh, an agent assigned to the case who is interviewing all the students uh, to try to get an idea. Is, is there anything that these people have in common? Um, and uh, Mara at one point is tasked with going to buy drugs from the local <laughs> drug dealers. <laughs> yeah. Cause they think it's something to do with maybe like a local strain um, that's causing it. Yeah. And by the way, this, dope dealing couple is <laughs> one of the cuter couples in the movie they seem to really dig one another <laughs> they do and they have this whole plan they're just gonna leave town and like they're not waiting around and stuff and oh yeah and so mara uh, on the government dime is going <laughs> to buy all of their drugs <laughs> yeah and they're like great God bless america <laughs> right because now now we could sell all the drugs we're sitting on, use that money to get out of here. Yeah. And so they're driving her to uh, the stash. Yeah, because to- they don't have it on them because you never know when a raid's going to happen. And I'm just like, I love, I love how they really, like, it's a real business for them. You know, they protect their investments. Sure. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. I think it's so good. I mean, a couple of rules. You don't sit on your stash and you don't get high on your own supply. Yeah, hundred percent. Ice tea has taught us nothing, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's it's that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but on the way to get the drugs, the the dude uh, behind the wheel pops, and yes. then they like the the girl manages to get into the driver's seat, and then she pops. And uh, there's a really wonderful scene where Dylan shows up at the site of this accident where the car has flipped over and so forth and thinks that this has happened to Mara too. And and then he sees a bloody handprint on a rock and follows this trail where she is in a river trying to get clean. And, uh, and he's like, I thought, I, I thought it had happened to you. And as they're leaving the scene, a bunch of people show up in hazmat suits, yeah. which leads to Mara saying, what is this E.T. bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> Can we also just real quick, just go back to the moment where they're hugging and he's like, I thought it, it, I thought it was you. And like, he's crying out yeah. of relief and just fear and panic. And it's just like... It's not like it's not really paid attention to. It's like it's no, there's no zoom in, there's no anything. But it's just like if you see it, it's just it's so heartfelt and so like raw. And I just I was like, oh my god, like he's just so so relieved that she's okay, you know. And it was just such a sweet sweet moment. It really is actually. I think it could be one of my favorite film, uh, moments in the film just because it's it's so genuine uh but yeah no this et bullshit that cracked me right up <laughs> yeah it, it's a real nice term because you're right it is this really heartfelt moment and and i think the way that they present their relationship at this point in the movie like nobody says love to one another yet uh no. and when it happens it's adorable but, but it doesn't oh my happen god here. yeah um <laughs> Um, <laughs> but but it's kind of clear like oh they're they are they're these are two young people who are very much in love with one another and and yeah his emotion is raw there and but yeah so the et bullshit is that all of the seniors of covington high school 
are now going to be kept in this, you know, plexiglass tent. She called it. She calls it a condom. Yeah, the condom. <laughs> We're stuck in this condom. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and and so they're all held together to to run tests and to be given uh, test medication to try to keep them from popping. And it doesn't really work because people continue to pop, at least at first. Mm -hmm. I love that sequence set to the old Everly Brothers song where they're doing the pills. Um, I can't remember the name of the actual song now off the top of my head. It's Bye Bye Love, yeah. Bye Bye Love, yeah. The the Everly Brothers version of it is what I know best, but I'm sure other people have actually recorded it. But the Bye Bye Love, while they're doing all of these pills and the way that it's played so slow, and it like they took a, a little... A little wink and or nod from Donnie Darko, the way that he would, uh, they, they had the music for Mad World, which is much more upbeat and happy in the original version. And then it's played down and kind of somber with like minor chords and things. They did the same thing with Bye Bye Love to this while they're playing it. And the sequence of just watching the kids explode one at a time where they're just trying to go about their lives and then randomly one of them explodes. It was just so well done and so touching. And... If you didn't get the metaphor and it wasn't being driven home enough for you at that point, you you clearly are way too dense. And I'm sorry that I missed it. Well, yeah. I've got two I, things I love in this whole <laughs> sequence. One is when uh, <laughs> Mara and actually three things, three things that and, and I'll shut up about it. But uh, there's the <laughs> scene where Mara and Dylan are making out, but it is that like his tongue is sticking out and she just starts kissing his tongue and then oh, rubbing her so face gross. on it. It's, no, it's gross. It's it, so gross. <laughs> I think that is very funny. I no, thought it was an adorable cute couple moment. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's disgusting because my <laughs> oh, so my bloke, right? He will I'll go into a kiss and I'll obviously have my eyes closed. Um and then instead of kissing me, he'll like put his head back and just leave his tongue. So I end up kissing his tongue. Ugh, it's so gross and i'm not expecting it and he just and he and he thinks it's so funny and it's not it's gross <laughs> so well in this case mara was willingly kissing his tongue so therefore yeah it's i just cute. don't know why you would though it's just it's slimy and just ugh, <laughs> yeah, as long as you're brushing your teeth on the regular it's fine <sighs> i just don't like it it's uh, slippery. you know to each their own um <laughs> but I like that moment between them. I also like the E.T. moment where they're E.T. Eddie. Oh, that is so great. When so they're, adorable. When they're just screeching it by the end. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> and, and clearly pissing off the, the workers who are, you know, putting them in their plastic bubbles and whatnot. Um, yeah. And and then to, uh, <laughs> to Court's point about this, the metaphor being laid plain here, there's a, a terrific... Uh, pres- like PowerPoint presentation they are given by some government <laughs> official where they're like, look, your government is very concerned about this and our thoughts and prayers are oh, with you all. Thoughts and prayers line. Yeah, and they're like, well, f- how about fuck that? How about you do something that's going to help us? Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, we're working on that. Mm-hmm. And and Mara has that great moment where she's like, it just seems like you come out down here to tell us a bunch of shit that you, you're thinking about doing, but you don't actually do anything yeah and and yeah. that is the most pointed attack about school shooting and the fact that you know it is ridiculously easy in this country for anyone to get their hands on a gun and then every yeah. time a school shooting happens everybody's like who could have seen this coming it's oh like my well, you know in a world where and especially a culture where anxiety is rising among teenagers and also it is super easy to get a gun. Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't know that yeah. it's the most shocking thing that happens. But thoughts and prayers, though, Bo. Thoughts and prayers. Th- thoughts and prayers. Like, there's no reason we would ever legislate that, because God, God forbid we give up a little bit of freedom so that, uh, you know, children are safe in schools. It's it, yes. it, You know what makes It's not sense. even giving up freedom. It's actually some bullshit of lowering the possible manufacturing of said weapons the manufacturers have everybody in their pocket in congress and that's why it keeps going um, it's such bullshit it, it's so much easier just to put metal detectors and police in schools that's mm-hmm. way cheaper 
or give teachers the guns and then everyone's fine. That that is my That's favorite. what all of these yeah. various pills represent too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and and that's the whole sequence is like it, finally they reach a point where they they believe that they have found a pill that can keep the teenagers from popping. Yeah. And <laughs> Go on, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just laughing ironically. Yeah, so they're released <laughs> back into the wild. Uh Dylan and Marintess and all our central characters are are fine. Uh although there is this heightened sense of well what do we do? Like we're going to go ahead and graduate and maybe after we graduate that's what's going to break the curse of of yeah. all of us popping, but that's that's kind of where we're stuck is trying to figure out how to deal with this constant anxiety of well we think we're okay but maybe not we just got to get through graduate just got to survive high school kind of thing and it's not even just like a metaphor of like because you know you all say like, oh my god i just got to survive today like you just got to get through this and it's like a metaphor but like in this film and in real life in america it's like you actually have to survive high school and it's just the most ridiculous thing but it's like it's as you said, like I think you said earlier, but just this film is just so so good at showing how that must affect students every day on that ground level, you know? Because we see so much of like, I mean, this is my perception from England anyway. So we see like, you know, so many things about, um, you know, like what the government's <clears throat> quote unquote doing, and like you know, protesting and you know, concerned parents and all of these kinds of things. Um, but you don't ever see it on that ground level from the kids, and or you'll see it after the fact, but you won't like see what it's like on the day to day and how that impacts them and how that like inhibits their enjoyment for something that really should be such a great time for them and you know and and I've never seen anything that that puts it forward in this way where it's you know irreverent and it's got it, pop culture stuff and it's got this central love story which is so sweet and so organic and you have this really great kids and oh you need the football team can we just have a mention of the football team and how like you know they 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 mention how um uh love is is actually is he's gay and it came out to us and we all embraced him and stuff and there's none of that like toxic masculinity they're just so like in in so celebratory and so in support of like you know their their gay um uh, uh like you know team member and stuff and how they have that whole party and things and oh not a party but they have like the um is it is it a party they have like the whole thing and they're like celeb like yeah it's kind like, of a memorial yeah that's yeah that's right yeah and um and it's just like it was so nice to sort of break away from the stereotype that we see so often in media about. Football, American football teams at school has been this very macho, very kind of like toxic in, um, sort of environment and things. And I just, I really, really um, love that. And so you have these kinds of things going on, but at the same time, it doesn't pull away. If anything, it, it further heightens just how, um, how chaotic and how like nerve wracking the lives of these kids are because they don't know if the next day will be their last or whatever. Um, and it's just it's just done in this real perfect like balance between kind of comedy and heartwarming and wholesomeness and terror like sheer terror you know it's just done really well anyway sorry carry on yeah the the moment and now since we mentioned it earlier we'll we'll talk about this scene now the scene where it's Dylan's birthday and this is on the other side of them getting out of the condom and yeah and he has he told uh mara story previously about how when he was a kid uh, after his father died he would go into the family barn with uh you know his stereo and he would play music and dance by himself and cry and yeah. and that was the thing that he he had never told anybody but he told her and hers is that she's writing a book called all the feels <laughs> um, which is very funny but uh but the so what mara does for his birthday is that she take like finds a barn and decorates it and 
says, uh, I wanted to, to make this for you so that you knew that you didn't have to be alone anymore and that I'll be here to dance with you. And it's a really, really sweet moment. And this is the point where he says, oh, my God, I love you. And she's like, what did you say? <laughs> like She just goes, fuck. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that moment I was just like, oh, yeah, that's like when I when I just turned around to Mike. I was like, do you have any more aspirin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, Not it, the response. It's, yeah, it, but she also says, say that to me later. Oh. And... Uh, because, you know, like they definitely both feel it, but, you know, especially Mara, who is this fiercely independent young woman, you know, for whatever reason, she's like, I'm not, I'm not ready to go there quite yet. Um, (laughs) even though they have had sex where she (laughs) says, my gift to you is to give you my body sexually in a sexual situation, (laughs) which is a very funny way to put that. Um, (laughs) Everything about their relationship is just non sequitur jokes that are absolutely hilarious and charming. And you just wish you could have talked like that through your whole life. Oh my gosh. Right. Oh my God. The script in this film is so good. It's so, so fresh. And this is the thing as well is like it, their relationship did have like potential for it to be really cutesy and great and like on that nauseous kind of like level but it's not it's so fresh and so funny and so as you say very charming it's it's so lovely and then you have these real moments of sincerity you know where she's like you don't have to dance alone anymore oh yeah and and that was the moment i the first time i saw this i was like oh my god he's about to die oh yeah i i was like this is gonna be it she's there he's gonna be swinging her around in this in this barn and he's gonna pop uh i was thinking the same thing yeah actually. i was they there's the camera angles and the, and things are too nice for too long because they catch you on these moments they're like every time they're these really sweet moments and then bam and it's like that noise and then the sudden chaos and um and it just really like shocks you out of these lovely look like you know they're having this really nice little moment where she's telling him about we love cox at the football game and then bam like he's gone and or and and it's like that every time so then we kind of get to this point of the film where we're kind of expecting every time there's like a nice lull for there to be something and it's so smartly done because it doesn't it doesn't happen but we're watching this moment which we know on the surface level is very sweet but underneath it all we're very anxious and I guess that must be what that's like for these kids they can have these lovely moments and have these really great times with their friends and their 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 boyfriends and girlfriends or whatever um but like underneath it all there's this level of anxiety where they can never truly relax I think it's really clever Well, that's where the horror actually comes in, right? It's showing you everyday life, but this unbelievable random event that could happen at any moment to these specific kids who just happen to be there. Mm, That's that's the horror of it. And the metaphor doesn't even get spread that thin whenever they're doing it. It just Mm -hmm. basically naturally fits with making that, that dread and that feeling. And that's exactly what the horror is derived from. It's because these wonderful moments are only there and stolen between possible death traps every time they go to school. Yeah. Or or in their case, at any moment, at any one of them could just explode for no reason at all. Yeah. Yeah. And but uh, there is no poppy in this scene. They they make it out of this only for uh, them to be in a a classroom later. Um being addressed by uh you know the the representatives in charge saying hey we it's been 50 something days since the last person popped we think we we really got this nailed down now and uh everything's gonna be fine graduation's gonna come you're you're gonna be able to to live your life and then all hell breaks loose because it's mm-hmm. not just one person popping, it's one person and then they start to run and then it's another person and another person. And this is, I mean, truly the school shooting kind of thing. Of, oh, God, yeah. You know, people running, trying to find an exit and as people around them are just exploding in, in blood. And um, Mara gets separated from Dylan and finally finds her way outside after B 
being dragged towards an exit by this kid who has put on like full military gear with a helmet and all kinds of stuff. But that Cole, yeah, and but that doesn't save him either. Like he goes too, and yeah, but it does keep most of them inside the outfit. (laughs) Yeah, because he's he's confined in this like all over body outfit. But it's so it's really it's really clever effect, but it's really horrible to watch because his body doesn't exist really anymore in that apart from like blood and viscera and so when the the suit falls you can see it's it's empty and it's just there was someone there and now there's not and it's just it's just really harrowing to watch that moment like i was really affected by that effect it does blow out to the tensile strength of the clothing and then it exits in some parts of the clothing and then the clothing shrinks back in yeah and then it slowly collapses as all the stuff starts to ooze out of the shoes. Yeah, exactly. I watched that I watched that twice because it was so shocking. I wanted to see if I could like kind of like get it on and take it all in again. And that's why I had to describe it. It was horrific. Yeah, it's really horrible. It's and it's again, it's not like this big effect that's played for shocks. Well, it's played for, no, no, no. it is shocking, but I mean it's not like they don't spend time on it. They don't like revel in it like if it was like any other kind of film, like they may have because of the effects used. And I'm sure there was a lot of work gone into the way that it it all plays out. And any other film could have like, you know, done a big close up and really like dragged it out. But it doesn't. It's very much like you can watch this bit if you want. But equally, we're we're moving on now and we we need to follow Mara and we're heading out the door um, sort of thing. And it's like a lot of those moments where it's like everything's really subtle and there was almost like little rewards for when you are paying attention like you get to see all these little extra bits whether it's something that's really heartfelt or it's something that's really like horrible um and i really appreciate that yeah and and so she makes it outside and that's where you know she's looking around she's covered in blood she's in shock and and then dylan comes around the corner her knight in shining armor is there and runs up to her, hugs her, and says, oh my god, I, th- I thought something had happened to you. And and that is the moment where he goes. Yeah. And he doesn't even finish the word happened to you, really. Like, he's like, I thought something happened to you, and then he catches his breath and explodes. Yeah. Yeah. And the, it just goes red. Like, the whole screen just goes red. And so you don't know. There's a moment where you're like, who is it? Who's gone? Like, who's... You know, and like, well, like I, I guess if I really thought about it, it was probably obvious because she's narrates from, and she's like looking back. But because I was so caught up in the scene and things, there was this moment for me where I was just like, "Oh my god, who is it? Which one is it?" Like, and they hold on it long enough to where you're wondering if that's just the end because she exploded and there's the credits. Yeah, yeah, like, I literally would this thought film that was gonna do happen. that to you, right? <laughs> oh, it would. It totally would if it wanted to. Like, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't have a problem with it if it did either. I'd be like, oh, my God. Dick. Yeah. <laughs> you assholes. Yeah. And and that's uh, like the the big chunk of the movie following this up until the kind of very end of it is Mara trying to deal with this. Like she is, uh, you know, goes from extreme depression where. You know, she doesn't get out of bed when her father, uh, her parents, by the way, are just wonderful. Oh, uh, yeah. And, you know, they're checking on her, but she doesn't even respond to their voices. She just crawls under her bed to to basically try not to exist. You know, that's that's how she's dealing with this. And uh, there's a very, very funny moment where she is showing her dad this drink that she's made. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> where she uh she talks about uh how she has discovered a thing that allows her not to feel anything and she says guess what it is it's alcohol <laughs> he says why are you whispering and she says because i'm underage and i'm not supposed to drink it um <laughs> it's it's very like it's funny but also it's really heartbreaking because this girl who is so like full of life and energy suddenly becomes this person that is just so gripped by sorrow Mm. that she just, she can't stand it. You know, she can't stand anything. She seems to be one of those people that really feel emotions. Like everything that she feels, she feels completely, 
you know like if she's happy she's really happy if she's like grieving she is a, like as you say she's a complete world of hurt um you know she seems like to be one of those people where everything is very very at the forefront and real for her i wasn't really thinking that i handled it whenever i lost my first love kind of like how mara does but the crawling under the bed and just trying to disappear and not exist. Yeah. And like, I didn't crawl into a bottle because there was no way I was going to be able to get alcohol at like 14 <laughs> all, all that easily. But, um, but you didn't have a beard then? Actually, I kind of did. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, makes sense. I was being sarcastic, but like, okay, I love that. <laughs> no, I, I had, um, when I started dating her, she was the one that noticed I had peach fuzz and she's the one that told me I needed to start shaving like at 12. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wait, I don't yeah. know about boys. Is that young? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, not necessarily. It just really depends. But yeah, I, I had um a full face beard that was almost as thick as what I have now, um, probably by the age of 15 for sure. Oh for my sure. God. Okay. Yeah, I know that that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was no one rocking that in my year like, when we well, were like, 15. Yeah. Like my morning period of when I turned four, like when I was like 14, my morning period, like that summer of seventh grade was also uh, puberty turns court into a man in one summer. <laughs> nice. Like, like I, I incredible hulked. Like I felt like I was Tom Hanks in Big, where I would wake up and every day my clothes would be way too small. It was, it was monstrous. I just became this. I, I became actual size, like what I was supposed to be. And like, I seriously, like the beard started getting like really dark and and thick and everything like that. And my voice got as deep as it is now, you know. And and it just like everything like over the course of a summer. So when I came back in like eighth grade, like n people thought I was a new kid. <laughs> oh wow Bye -bye. Yeah. Bye -bye. <laughs> so like i'm going through this dark period and i'm also turning into a man at the same time <laughs> physically speaking it was a really really dark really really twisted summer and yeah when you're talking about mara feeling everything in these moments that you're describing yeah i kind of went to these dark areas too at the same time it mm. was it was a hell of a three months <laughs> yeah no i did the same when when andy broke up with me like i was i it was literally like my entire world collapsed i didn't get out of bed for about a month like um, I remember <laughs> I remember coming home my friend walked me home that night and I kind of I, I don't even think I could tell my parents I don't think I could even formulate the words my friend had to tell them what had happened um and my mum just went oh no and like my dad's like ah oh, she'll be over in a few weeks and my and I remember like my mum just going no she won't oh and wow uh yeah it was it was that and um and she was right it actually uh for me to fully get over him it took me in about four years until I met my like first proper adult relationship not the guy I'm with now but like uh, the guy beforehand um like it took for me to to fall in love with him for me to truly get over him and that was a period of about four years really um I mean it didn't help that I continued to sleep with the guy <laughs> for a period of time after um but uh but that's fine that's by the way um, it sucks when they come back for just that oh i would no i was the one initiating oh 100 oh. oh. like uh because of all his faults he uh he was packing um <laughs> so, so basically I what you're it. saying is you're you're not gonna let heartache get between you and a fuck i get it it's cool i mean Basically, you've just summed up my life in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> not, I not, tend to do that. Not I'm passing, sorry. Not passing oh, up you've a just plug. seen right into the soul the of me in that story. one sentence. <laughs> I, I do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's really nice because now I have something that I can just give people <laughs> instead of the million fucking words that I normally use. So, <laughs> Look, I'm not like, going to let heartache get between me and a fuck. Yeah, like, yeah, oh my God. But like, I, I say this to people, like when I'm in a relationship, like I'm a, like 100%, that's me committed. As soon as I'm single though, oh, I am single. Um, Like no holds barred. Like my friend's hate it when I'm single because not only am I real single but I'm also really fucking stupid because when I need when I want to get when I want to get laid nothing nothing but that fuck is going through my my head um and I will <laughs> I have put myself into some really stupid situations just to have an orgasm and not have to do it myself so samesies you what samesies 
Right, right. Um, yeah, like, oh, God, the lengths that I, I've gone to. Like, not in terms <laughs> of, like, not in terms of, like, desperation, in terms of, like, it, it was difficult for me to get a shag. Oh, God, that sounds awful as well. Uh, I just mean, like, okay, uh, I just, okay, so give an example. Like, I just, like, there was a guy who I was shagging, but he was, like, living across the country. So I would drive across country, um, which, does, in fairness to Americans, is probably not that far. But for me, it was, like, from one end of the country to the other. So it was about a two-hour drive. And then I would stay the night, and then I'd get up at, like, crack of dawn but early to drive back to the other side of the country to get to work for like 8 a.m and I would like have to bring all my stuff and everything and, and do that but it was worth it for that like 45 minutes of you know whatever <laughs> so yeah but stuff like that you know I'll I'll pretty much if you just say jump I'll go how high <laughs> if your if your dick is worth it <laughs> oh, well sometimes played. even if it's not you know like just you catch me in the right mood <laughs> Oh, I really wish I hadn't said something. This yeah, no, that see, that's my move. Is the eh, at least you're in the right mood. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, was yeah, where we at the film? It, no, at at the depths of of this. Oh, movie depths is of despair. Where we yeah, we're in the pit of despair. Yeah, and so a uh, couple of funny notes here. The drink that she makes is called "All My Friends and Boyfriend Are Dead." Oh God, yeah. Uh, which is both hilarious and heartbreaking all at once, which is kind of how this movie goes. Yeah. With the um, excess of grenadine, it would also be delicious. Yeah. Oh, so much grenadine in that. Yeah. And she has uh, a conversation with her best friend, Tess, where she shows up drunk and is like, hey, let's just go get fucked up. And Tess is very much like, I want to graduate and I want to get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. um, that whatever happens is going to happen, but I got to like, I am living as if there is going to be a tomorrow. Yeah. And, and what she tells Mara is you want to stop existing until you stop existing. Yeah. And, but Such that, a great line. It, it's terrific, but that's not enough to shake her out of it either. And she ends up, uh, <laughs> blatantly stealing, uh, some liquor from a liquor store uh, the agent that she's talked to um, comes to visit her <laughs> oh and she <laughs> does one of those like, like, hey, think fast and throws a bottle, which misses the agent and just busts out the back window of her car, um, which <laughs> she's <laughs> also Face so though. fucking drunk that I can't believe she's able to stand up at this moment. Yeah, her face as well when she realizes that the bottle's flown through the agent's window is this part horror but part oh my god this is the best moment of my life and it, that was literally what my face was I was like oh my god this is awful but it's so good um but yeah it was it her face was great <laughs> yeah and so then there comes the the big prom slash graduation which is all one thing on one evening <laughs> yeah. uh, which get that shit done <laughs> yeah uh and there's another conversation she has with tess uh which is really sweet where you know she kind of acknowledges that she's really fucked up but she's also like look i want I, I want nothing but the best for you and she says i want you to live forever like an elf and <laughs> yeah. tess is like wait do elves live forever and she says, well, Dylan said they they live forever unless, uh, what were the conditions? Like, unless... They were like, they get murdered. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, there was something else. I can't remember what the other one was. Yeah. And what, do you remember? I don't remember. And she says, uh, he was such a nerd. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's just another reminder. Like, Dylan is still with her constantly. Yeah. And... So she has also read online this theory that she is the cause of this curse. Yeah. Uh, because she was present at the time when all the, all these people exploded. And so she goes into the prom, pours the remains of her bottle of tequila into the punch bowl. <laughs> this is and, so good. And then, While whipping <laughs> off the teachers that are staring at her doing it. I, she raises it higher when they see her. So, like, there is no hiding what she's doing. And then just grabs the punch bowl to drink it with the ladle. 
Yeah, it's <laughs> so fucking good. It's like that meme, you know, where like you cut a portion of the cake and then you take the remainder of the cake. Like that is your piece isn't the small bit, yours is the big bit. Like it's it reminded me of that. It was great. Yeah, it's it's so good. And but so she drunkenly at one point when it's her her turn to graduate, <laughs> uh, and she's also wearing her Carrie prom dress. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that uh, she wore uh, but couldn't put blood on because people... <laughs> Caitlin had... ruined it. Yeah, Caitlin ruined it. <laughs> but uh, not like that. <laughs> but not like that. I'm really sorry, guys. Yeah, because yeah. Caitlin's friends were all, like, memorializing her locker and stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, Caitlin ruined my outfit. I mean, no, it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> but she gives this, this speech to the class about how she's sorry that she doesn't know why she's the one, but she clearly has caused all of this. And that she, you know, if she could take it all back, she would. And kind of drops the mic on the podium and so forth. <laughs> and But at the end of it, it's like a real Spartacus moment. Where even after she says that, somebody else stands up and is like, no, 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 it's me. And then someone else stands up and says, no, 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 it's me. And you can see that, oh, all these people are suffering from the same kind of survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. It's palpable. Yeah. You can feel every moment of every person talking. And then it just becomes so overwhelming when there's just a din of voices saying the same thing. And and so she wanders out of this graduation to Dylan's grave which kind of hilariously is another ET <laughs> quote on the grave that I says, love it so much. I'll be right here. <laughs> it's so perfect. I, I like when I saw that, I was like, oh, it works on so many levels. I must have that on my own grave. Like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's super cute. It, it's so, it's so Dylan. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, Mara collapses onto his grave and just lies there crying. And then in comes Dylan's mother, who says, do you mind if I join you? And so these two women, who are both mourning Dylan, lie on the grave and have this really wonderful conversation. Um, where Dylan's mother says, uh, did you ever hear... Uh, the story of the guy in Florida who fell into a sinkhole. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no. And she's like, yeah, just one day, uh, uh, his roommate heard uh, this incredible crash and he went in there and this guy had fallen into a sinkhole and died. And uh, <laughs> Mara's like, so now I have to be afraid of sinkholes too? She's yeah. like, no, <laughs> that's not really the point. The point is, you none of you deserve what's happening but that's also just kind of life. And it it happens quickly and, and sometimes it's incredibly cruel. But it's, you know, you can't stop fate. You It just, life is, is going to throw you these curveballs all the time. And it really sucks when it happens. But that's what it is. That's just life. And, you know, they, they kind of commiserate with one, one another and they cry together and it ends in this really nice moment where she says, would you like to come to dinner next week? And and Mara agrees to, which is, from a psychological point of view, having anyone in her state make plans for the future yeah. is is a net positive. 100%. And, and it is that thing of, like having that thing to look forward to and the fact that it's linked to the to the person who she so dearly misses and they have that bond and you know you can imagine that that's a relationship between her and his mum that will last the, her whole life in some respects like it might only be at a point where they send Christmas cards but that that's a bond for life and it's really lovely because I don't think that they have met before have they really like no yeah it's this it, is their first proper interaction yeah when when she see when mara sees her she says hi dylan's mom yeah hi dylan's mom yeah and um and yeah and it's just it's really lovely because it's you know you always have um you i, I feel like this is something that kind of transcends culture um at least like in in western cultures where 
you'll generally always have like another adult who's not your parents who you can talk to or who you feel like you could talk to if you wanted to and it's not because like your parents wouldn't talk to you about those things necessarily but when like you're a teenager there's just some things that you can't talk to your parents about you know and like I always feel like that's really important to have it like if it's you know, because there's always something that you're not going to talk to your parents about. And I always feel like it's really important that everyone has that other adult who can help guide you and be there for you in whatever way that you need in that moment for whatever it is that you're needing help with. And like, she's obviously that, but because like, you know, as you mentioned before, like Mara's parents are wicked cool. Like, you know, they, they give her a spliff and stuff and um you know they're like you we know you smoke we you are terrible at lying about it she's like i'm not terrible like no you are you are terrible at covering that up and um and she's just like this what being an adult feels like and they're like yeah pretty much (laughs) yeah except with with more more anxiety anxiety. you know exactly um which is absolutely bang on um and uh that scene where they're hitting the vape together, like the, the entirety of the parents, where it's basically the time where they're like, look, to us, you're an adult now. This is how it works. And they're just basically, that's why they're smoking up with them. Yeah. That was a really, really touching moment. It's, and yeah. I can't say why, but um, I kind of like really, <laughs> I, I had a moment like that with a relative who like mm-hmm. sat me down and was like, as far as I'm concerned, you're an adult now and now we're going to get high. Yeah. Yeah. I like... uh I remember um, having, not maybe, because my mum used to partake in various things. Um, And so we always had like a very open and like honest chat about stuff. Like my my mum was always that mum for my friends. Like they would all, like if they were ever in trouble, they would come over and they'd like ask my mum for help and stuff. Um, And our house is pretty much like an open house for my friends. Like there was always someone crashing our house or whatever. And so like my mum and me had like the really kind of like open like relationship where we could like talk about a lot of things. Um, And uh, I remember being out with like my friends and my mum always had this rule of like, if you're going to do it, do it in the house, you know, like because at least I can keep an eye on you and I know you're okay and I know who you're with and whatever. And that was anything. That was, that was weed. That was, you know, drinking, that was sex, whatever. Um, and, um, yeah, and we were just like out in the garden, just passing around this, you know, puff, puff, tote kind of thing, puff, puff, pass. And, um, and I remember like my friend going, Lynn, do you want to, do you want a bit? And she was this close, like this close because she was outside just having a cigarette and she was I could like tell her that she was that close to like she was like oh no I mustn't I, I just fall over you know like in a very kind of like mum fashion um but like uh it was this kind of but ever like since that moment and like the, and like a couple of other moments like that it was like well she always says this thing like we're talking as you know we're talking as grown-ups Kate you know like and then she'll tap she'll lay on something like really real about about herself for me I'm like sometimes I wish I didn't know some things honestly um but um but um in fairness she's probably just getting back at me for all the things that she wished she hadn't heard um <laughs> so uh we'll the, the 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 sins that we visit upon each other oh god right anyway yeah um so um yeah anyway so like uh that moment between mara and and dylan's mom is just is very sweet and i just it it's not a long scene um and there's not really a lot that happens in it on the surface but there is so much that happens in that conversation with you know Mara's mental well-being and like the steps that she takes now with her grieving period and then also as well like how that's mirrored with Dylan's mum um who's I don't think we ever find out her name and um and like and then this new relationship that's forged as a result of this grieving like shared grieving and you know and all of this it's just it's just such a really wonderful scene and it's just it's so expertly done and again there's that these little moments of of comedy in there too because this film just can't can't not yeah and i love it for it i like that mara at one point says life really fucking sucks and and dylan's mom says it does it really does really does yeah and it's it's just an acknowledgement of like yeah 
I mean, that's the world we're born into, and we just have to deal with this. And and I mean, I totally agree, Kate. This this whole scene is about both of these characters understanding that they have been grieving for a long time and or or deeply at at uh, at the very least and that they've just got to start living again yeah there's that really lovely moment actually where, where mara actually turns because she's been like saying about how she's been she's like hey how, are you okay yeah you know and then her mom like because anyone else could have just go because that that whole automatic thing is go yeah i'm fine and especially like as a like a parent to a child even if it's not that child's parent is to like you shield the children from seeing you like upset and things because you don't want them to have that burden and but she and she just and again it's that moment of like well you're an adult now you've been through so much that you know I'm not going to sugarcoat this just like no I'm not okay um but again it's that like that that trust and that um you know the that that relationship that's forged there because they're both being so open and honest with each other and and that's just cementing you know like you're hurting I'm also hurting we're hurting together and you know and we can help each other out a little bit with this kind of thing like we can we don't have to be alone yeah and they both miss Dylan that's the thing that they have in common is that they both love Dylan yeah and you know to to (laughs) quote the rock they both, you know, they spilled blood in the same mud. And and like you said, they have this bond that will last all of their lives. You know, like they, yeah. they, this, you know, like my aunt and I are strangely close now because when my mom was dying, like she and I were the ones dealing with it. Yeah. And, and that's one of those things that like it totally sucked. But on the other side of it, like she and I have this very very good and easy rapport where we both kind of understand one another and we like i she can be quite a pill at times but i get along (laughs) with her just fine because like i know why she's that way and and Mm -hmm. and we have an understanding that runs really deep as a result of that yeah that's lovely and you can imagine that like dylan's mom well i'm skipping ahead of it to the end but like when they have their beach hut like she comes up every week, every like you know, every weekend, every now and then, sort of thing. Like, and she also dips her toes in the sand and has a bit of a hookah. Like, you can just sort of see that happening. Like, you know, once or twice a year, she'll come up and be like, "Oh, hey, ladies, what's hanging? Yeah, where's that? Where's that hookah? I'm gonna get my flip flops on." <laughs> well, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of where we are at, at the end of the movie. Like, Mary goes home, uh, has a nice moment with her parents where she apologizes to them, mm-hmm. and and you know uh definitely starts to become more of a real person again and so then there's this big speech that she has at at the end of the film about the the cruelty of life the the uh the whimsical nature of grief in a lot of ways um a couple of lines i really i really liked from this is where she's like you know it, a comet came along at just the right time and in just the right place and it killed all the dinosaurs and it's just all random and the way she puts it is the world is a fucking cruel piece of shit and nothing makes sense and the only thing you can do is to put up your middle fingers and be all like fuck you life suck my dick i'm gonna be amazing in spite of all of life shit yeah yeah it's so great this film is like really inspiring like i have absolutely no shame i'm 33 taking inspiration from an 18 year old fucking a she became my hero as soon as she bit that guy's hand you know like <laughs> and then and then as well like she because the, the, there's the opening monologue bit and then there's this kind of like you know book ended monologue and she references uh she doesn't ever re- re- reference the name but she'll reference the president um (laughs) and she's like you know where she's like oh you know what fuck it i'm gonna be president and then he's and then you know our president is gonna be like from his gold plated coffin like um look at me going who the fuck's this bitch and i'm gonna turn around and be like that's president bitch to you motherfucker like and (laughs) just like you don't she doesn't say we know like we she knows that we know this you know yeah well they reference it's really great there's an earlier reference to that where she talks about wearing black after the election for a yeah. while. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, um, 
and, and it gets kind of wistful at one point where she says like i'm gonna go on and uh i'm, I'm not gonna waste time and i'm gonna have this house on the beach where tess and i dip our toes in the st- sand yeah and i'm gonna meet other guys and i'm gonna fall in love and maybe i'm gonna be a dope ass mom and <laughs> uh and then the really sweet moment where she says and and then sometimes late at night i'll tell them about dylan and Ooh, he it's me. just what a wonderful moment, you know? Yeah. Uh, that like she gets a bit Andy Dufresne on us. Yeah. That there, there is always going to be like, this is always going to be the guy that she fell in love with first. And, and in some ways, uh, best because it was so pure and it ended so fast and yeah. that, that he was taken away before all the vagaries of relationships can happen. Mm-hmm. It was nothing but pure, happiness and joy and love and this guy that you know would have would have done anything to move the world that he could for her and uh and that you know as she puts it like this is a guy she'll think of every day and yeah. you know and it as sad as that is it's also kind of wonderful and there's a what was the other line uh it, it's her saying i'm gonna live the life that uh, I want right now, whether or not there is a tomorrow. Yeah. And and yeah. that's the conclusion the movie reaches, right? Like, the, the movie poses the question of, like, how do you live in this world where you could die any time? And she makes the point of, like, well, anybody can die any time. Not just me. Yeah. Anybody can. You, watching this movie, can die any time. And mm-hmm. so the trick is to live in such a way that if that were to happen, that, you know you have told life to suck your dick (laughs) yeah yeah definitely i feel like everyone should just tell life to suck their dick yeah yeah uh it's a good it's a good mentality yeah more vulgar nor inspiring words could i have ever created (laughs) right that's it she's my fucking hero like yeah no definitely and i think like um it yeah it's just it's a really it's again it's that blend of like really funny and fresh like dialogue but with this very kind of wholesome and meaningful um message and like it does and I think as well like you're right with um with the whole thing about with about Dylan and how it doesn't have the time to start you know start getting frayed edges and things getting strained and not only that but like you know this whole thing I mean obviously you know she has Tess and Tess is a wonderful friend um and their friendship is is so great um but this whole thing is probably well it will have been made so much easier like he's the light in this whole fuck ton of darkness that she's going through and they're going through but they have each other and they hold each other's hand through everything and they guide each other through this this terror that they're going through and all this uncertainty and like they're each other's one constant thing that they have they can rely upon and you know and this is also why you know I think uh, I mean it would hit her hard regardless but the fact is is that he's taken from her so suddenly and so cruelly um and she has left there's still no cure they don't know any more what's happening that they did yesterday and she now has to navigate that alone and without her her shining light basically and um you know it's it's something that you know if you have like a big trauma like that but there's something that has helped you through when it comes to after the fact you know that it's very easy to see like it's gonna mean he's gonna mean more to her than most first loves do to most people because not only did it not have that time to fuck up and go horrible but also like he got her through a lot of this really horrific traumatic time that will have affected her for the rest of her life but maybe not so much it would have done like if he hadn't been there kind of thing you yeah. know so yeah. it's um it's the all of it all of it combined all of it like just fits so perfectly it's yeah it's really excellent writing yeah. and, a, and a wonderful love story I, you know it it 
when I saw it for the first time, the the one thing, I mean, aside from that sort of life affirming ending and so forth, which, which I think is really wonderful, but it does just remind me of, you know, that dopishly pure first love that you have where you're just like I, this person that I'm with man. the, you know, the sun rises and sets with them. It's, you know, Shakespearean in its passion, mm. you know, it's like, it, it's the sun and Juliet is the East. Um, yeah, it, it's that kind of thing. And, uh, um, it, you know, and, and also like the other takeaway when I was watching again, I was like, yeah, love is great. It's great to be in love. And, and this is a movie that gets that right. Like if you find the right person that you can vibe with and that you can laugh with, then man life is it turns out a lot easier yeah definitely and life's too short to not go for that for sure like we were talking about earlier of like you know if you're afraid of ever making the first move don't be the worst case scenario is you end up not with the person which is the situation you're already in yeah yeah you know um yeah there is there like that kind of timidity is both understandable and crippling. And I think mm-hmm. once you're in a relationship that is positive and encouraging one time, it kind of cures you of that, you know, like it, it that kind of stuff gives you a, a, a courage to, to keep going. Like, even if that relationship doesn't work out, then you understand sort of the, the mathematics of it to some Mm -hmm. degree where you're like oh okay well that didn't work but i understand also that you know here here is the thing i need to do to pursue my own happiness um and the uh, the other little idiom i would use here is that also uh you you have to be in a position where you can love yourself because that's the only way anyone's gonna love you really is you know you got you got to be the kind of person that somebody can love. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it's like RuPaul says: if you don't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? Yeah, I think also true. it helps if you get to see how someone else views you, and when you know that someone sees a value in you that you yourself could never find, it changes you. Because yeah. you Absolutely. are forced into a perspective that you never had before, and you have to evaluate the things that you dislike about yourself or the things that you're always so critical about yourself about. And when you get to see that that person, what you know, when you get to understand what that person sees in you and what they feel for you, and those that reflection, it of of those emotions actually does change you. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. And that's definitely something that this film absolutely 100% captures. And that is literally all I have to add because you guys have covered every other piece of topic that I wanted to talk about so eloquently and so much better than me. Oh, 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 uh, no, that's uh, that's very sweet of you to say. Was that Tully? Did I just hear Tully? Yeah, that's a little Tully action. Oh, I thought it was my kid. My kid's been, I think my kids were awake. That's right. That's what I got my partner for. <laughs> yeah, nope, just a cat. <laughs> no, just a cat. Yeah, could be your kid That's though. A, I mean, I mean, she does sound like a whiny little cat, honestly. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just realized I called your cat whiny. I just meant she sounds like a whiny cat. No, not my, your cat's whiny. My cat's a whiny asshole. There is no getting around. Oh, that. okay. <laughs> well, they're your words. <laughs> yeah, no, that is one chatty ass cat, uh, and and is a real jerk about it. So no, no offense taken. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, uh so any anybody have uh any parting thoughts here as we've wrapped up the movie and also given the kind of quality advice that Heart of Horror is known for in its one episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh no, I think that's that's uh that's pretty good. Um there was some uh there was a couple of other stories that I had in my notes, but they can be saved for another episode, I'm sure there'll be other incidents of vomiting and stuff. <laughs> Well, nobody is going to turn their back on a good vomit story. That's for sure. <laughs> ah, well, you always leave them wanting more. So you just have to tune in next time and see whether I bring them up. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I've shared more and shown a side of me that no one really has seen before. Because I don't think I ever get to be this tender on my actual podcast. It creeps Aww. Matt out when I am. 
Oh, it's been lovely though, Court. Like it's re it's been not that I want to like you know like it's not, I don't want you to be feeling like you know any kind of negativity or anything about yourself or anything. But it's um it's been lovely to have you open up. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, All right. Uh, that, <laughs> so that's what I love about this show is it's not just you know yeah we're talking about a movie and stuff but we get to be real about shit and um and that doesn't always happen on podcasts about horror movies there you know it's always about viscera and whatnot and as many exploding teenagers as we've discussed tonight it's uh you know it's also about just uh navigating through life and that can be tricky and if you got uh if you're lucky enough to have somebody on that ride with you then uh boy it can it can sure make a, a world of difference um, well, blood and gluts includes a heart as well. So, ah, uh, <laughs> disgustingly, charmingly put. <laughs> yep. So, just to repeat, if uh, if you folks out there have uh, questions, uh, comments, whatever, uh, you can you can find me at, on Facebook at uh, the Dark Parade f uh, Facebook group or Legion Podcasts. Uh, you can email me at bo at legionpodcasts dot com. Or even find me on Twitter at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, feel free to ask or uh, lay down any information that you would like. Um, as always, you can say, hey, I don't want my name attached to this, but I, here is a story that I want to share. That is totally fine. You do not have to expose yourself emotionally the way that we have uh, on this episode. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Kate will take some of those as well. Yeah, sure. Feel free to like PM me on. I'm on like Instagram and I'm on Facebook. Uh, my Instagram is oh, fuck. What is it? I think it's like I think it's like at K A N J O U three seven because Anjou is my middle name. Um, and uh, I think I was being poncy when I made that handle. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you should change probably. it to Poncy Kate. Poncy K, yeah, maybe, I, maybe I will. Uh, so anyway, yeah, feel free to like um, slip, slide into my DMs, and um, and send me all your unsolicited Richard picks. Yeah, Cr crooked or otherwise. Um, but not real. I, I, but not real. I explicitly said Richard picks. Not, yeah, not the other one. Uh, but yeah, no. Nixon, not the other. Not the other. I, mean, I don't need any of that. I've had my fair share of those, and it's yeah, it's not as good as you think. Um, <laughs> Um, but no like if anyone wants to like yeah pop me any messages or stories or questions or like dear deirdres or anything like that would be cool excellent and and thanks again to court for uh coming on the show and and getting all vulnerable with us um 100 thank you very much court all right thank you very much for it, being it was so therapy for me Thank you for throwing. Thank you for letting me throw all that garbage all over this show. Oh, not garbage <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> I know. I'm just you know being facetious and no, all. I gotta put fine. the. I gotta put the walls back up. I'm feeling so vulnerable. <laughs> oh no! I like anytime I get like real about anything, I immediately have to like follow it up with like a dick or fart joke. So I get you. <laughs> yeah. Right, defensive mechanism. But no, in mm -hmm. all seriousness, uh, when you guys created this show and the idea, I loved it so much. And it was everything I was hoping it was going to be when the first episode came out. And that's why I was so enthusiastically insane about wanting to join it because it was an opportunity to do something I had never done before in podcasting. And I was so excited about that. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. I'm, I'm so glad you did. Uh, and uh, for you folks, we will be back in a month's time for another episode of Hard Horror with another movie, another set of uh, stories um and you know another round of revelations that range from the uh sweet and optimistic to the uh stinky and bathroom related <laughs> <laughs> which yeah we, we can't fit all of that on a t-shirt yet but i'm working on an acronym <laughs> I'm gonna. Are you gonna FBI explain to me the way that nicknames work? That is. Oh, so many good lines. I love that. Uh, I did also really quickly just love their little banter back and forth as well. The agent was so great. If more agents were like her, I won't finish that sentence. Um, but yeah, oh, everyone just go watch this film. Yeah, I think that's everyone go related. watch it. Everybody should yeah. watch Spontaneous. All right. Yeah, check it out. 
uh thanks again to court thanks as always to uh my my partner in crime and love <laughs> kate ah oh, does a swirly curtsy for you that you can't see <laughs> oh, and nor can anyone else but old, it's there <laughs> old swirly curtsy kate they call her and <laughs> we'll see everybody in a month bye bye all right yeah all right court uh thanks all right kate there is an emergency ses- session called back in yeah sorry it's scott crawford um uh oh my god the names of the his podcast are completely out of my head now but the friday nightmares um, crawford, podcast basically yeah. thank you thank you so much bro um in my defense it's like really fucking late um so uh or early as you might think of it. But yeah, he messaged on the when I said I was doing this, he said, Love this movie. <laughs> and <laughs> though it is such a hard man come to watch at the same time. Um, turns out it was stupid autocorrect, and he meant to say it's such a hard movie to watch at the same time, but I think I prefer his original yep, answer. Hard man come oh, to it watch. It's such a hard man come to watch. <laughs> uh, I think that's a Bob Dylan song. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it should be if it's not. <laughs> All right, emergency session <laughs> ended. We'll see you in a month. Okay, that's it now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>